You're listening to Drinks and a Movie with your host, Rudy. Spoiler alert. Well, Drinks and a Movie podcast, everyone, thanks for uh, tuning in and checking out this new episode. This one is going to be a video as well, so you can catch this on YouTube if you're just hearing the audio. I've got a special guest today, a writer, director, producer I've been wanting to chat with for a while, uh, Kenneth Castillo. He's got seven feature films, and you also used to bartend, too, so I think we're going to enjoy some drinks as well. And I'm really stoked to hear all your stories and just your, you know, everything about them. Um, your, your time in the in the industry and where you're going. It seems like you've got a lot of cool stuff coming up around the corner. Um, but yeah, thank you for joining me so much, man. Appreciate it. Rudy, thank you so much for having me. I'm a huge fan of your show. There are a lot of podcasts uh, being done these days, but I rarely found one that was so appropriate to myself. I'm a bartender, <laughs> yeah. filmmaker, and drinks in a movie when I saw your shows and interviews with, uh, you know, some guys that I know and respect, Danny De La Paz mm-hmm. and Daniel Virial, and I've seen your own documentary on Daniel Virial. Oh, yeah. I was like, so excited when you contacted me. I, I'm a big fan of your show. And yeah, I'm ready to talk. Let's talk some movies, man. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. Well, I appreciate that. Let's, um, We'll dig into the drink first. Sorry, everybody. The, I've got to keep the AC running because it's just super hot. So a little extra <laughs> fuzz, but we'll deal with it. Um, so I brought some mezcals and some rye. You said you'd be interested in that. And I guess we can do some mezcal first. We'll sure. go clear to <laughs> clear sure. to dark. Um, I brought mezcal 33 because I feel like I think this one is just fairly new out here. I think it just hit total I'm not lines. familiar with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, James Humphrey was on the show. She's the brand ambassador here. So. Mezcal 33 is a friend of drinks in a movie. So fantastic. Let's try some. Here we go. I'll pour you a little and let bit. Let me just put a little disclaimer. I don't normally drink on yeah. interviews. I'm, I'm making a pure <laughs> exception <Yeah. laughs> for you and your show. I appreciate um, that. But I love Mezcal. I love rye. And I know you've gotten some interesting, from watching your show, you've got some really great stuff that you've tried. So yeah. uh, we have to take advantage of that and, so, oh, yeah. <laughs> and try some cool stuff. Yeah. So. I just gave us a little taster since we got quite a bit here, but yeah, anything you want to go back to, have at it. Fantastic. Yeah, I haven't had this one in a while. It's um, yeah. Cheers, I mean, brother. I'll let you give me your thoughts. Oh wow, that's an easy one. Yeah, easy mezcal. That is an easy drinking yeah. one. Yeah, I like that a lot. I like this. Um, it's a fruitiness to it. Yeah, I feel like I get a lot um, of citrus off it, like yeah. right, right out the gate, like that kind of lime. You know, especially the the aroma of it. Yeah. So, where did you uh, bartend, by the way? If you want to mention that at all. Oh yeah, I've, I mean, probably my longest gig was at the. Actually, I don't want to mention them because my mm. last two years there was so terrible. Okay. <laughs> but I was there eleven years at a bar in downtown mm. LA, and it was good for nine of those years. Uh, I also bartended. Uh, my first bartending job was at the Cheesecake Factory. Oh really? Yeah, and I worked at the Sherman Oaks one, and that one was. Uh, like the fifth busiest one Mm -hmm. and you would a lot of interesting people would come through there a lot of celebrities ex-celebrities football players baseball players they all live in Sherman Oaks and Encino so they would come in and you know I met some uh, one guy that I met was uh, Michael Reagan Ronald Mm -hmm. Reagan's uh, eldest adoptive son okay and we actually became friends and he actually introduced me to Muhammad Ali, who was my hero. Really? Yeah. He invited me to, uh, they were doing a benefit at, uh, and it was actually, that's actually a cool story. Cause it was my last day at, um, I had booked my first official film, meaning one that I didn't sell finance. And so I'd put my notice in at cheesecake factory and I was going to start pre-production in that in July. And he came in with his family on my last day. And he was so excited and proud of me and everything. And he says, you know, what are you doing the October 26th of this year? And I said, um, hopefully directing my second film. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you are in the world, keep that date open. And I said, sure, why? And in our conversations, he had known that James Cagney and Muhammad Ali were my heroes. Mm-hmm. And his dad was best friends with James Cagney. <laughs> okay, so wow. that's how we kind of hit it off. Yeah. And so with Muhammad Ali, he's like, well, my grandmother's foundation, now Reagan Foundation, would do a, a fundraiser and they would honor a sports legend. Mm-hmm. And all these millionaires would go and bid on stuff and get to meet the sports legend, right? So that year they were doing Muhammad Ali and he said, uh, yeah, you and your wife are going to be our guest. So, you know, you hear that. I'm like, sometimes you've been to the bartender. It's yeah. like... 
people tell you things like this all the time, right. but outside, you're a priest there, you're outside yeah. and they don't, they act weird if you ever see them outside, right? right? Cause you know all their secrets. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he was true to his word. And like, I remember right when I got back, right when I finished rap, I rapped on my first film, I got an invitation and I, we were at the Reagan table and I'm giving you the short version of it, but the place went crazy when the champ came out and there was no security. Oh, man. Okay. Because they expected all these millionaires and billionaires to be on their best behavior. Right, right. And our table, the Reagan table, was right next to um, <clears throat> the Ali table. And Howard Bingham was there. I don't know if you know who Howard mm -hmm. Bingham was, but Howard Bingham is the photographer that has shot every famous picture of Ali. And he was there and nobody knew who he was except right. me. So I'm like, there's another legend. <laughs> I'm cool. going to talk yeah. to him. Yeah. So I got to chat with Howard Bingham, but um, eventually they had security surrounding his table. And around dessert time, Mike leans over to my wife. He's all, Carla, did you bring your camera? She says, yes. And he's all, come on, Ken. And he takes me to Ali's table. And I got to talk with Muhammad Ali and tell him what he meant to me in my life. And, Amazing. Um, Amazing. Yeah, man. I owe that to a guy I politically totally disagree with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. The other day I met um, on this red carpet event, I was shooting this actress who, you know, she was an older lady talking about the stuff she's doing. And she mentioned, yeah, I was the night of the hunter. I don't know if you're familiar with that movie, 1955, Charles Lawton. Oh yeah. Some of the best yes. black and white cinematography in the game. Easy. And she was, so she wasn't the little girl, like Pearl from the movie, but right. she was the double. So okay. she's the one that actually rode in the bow and that Robert Mitchum was carrying around. Wow. And I was like, wait, like after when we ended the interview, I was like, you were in Night of the Hunter because she's got to be like the last person. Right. That was Attached in that, that movie. Film. Yeah. She's the baby. Too, yeah, so. exactly. Like seven years old or right. something. I was like, yo, that's like my all time favorite movie or wow. one of them. Incredible. But yeah, the place that I used to work at, uh, Monty, where I've shot some of my episodes. Um, so the owner who passed away a couple of years ago, rest in peace, uh -huh. Rio. Um, his father is actually Taylor Hackford who, you know, oh, directed yeah. Blood wow. and Blood Out, like a, a lot of great movies, yeah, <laughs> but Blood and Blood Out is like, for me, the big one. And, you know, he'd come in sometimes uh, with Helen because he's married to Helen Gosh. Mirren and they'd have like events and whatnot. And um, really like cool people, by the way. Nice. <laughs> so one time Glad I was I was serving them at the at the bar and Taylor Hackford. Bro. Yeah, because I, I didn't realize it to like quite a bit later that like, Oh, he's the one who directed, like there's this whole connection. Oh, yeah. Well, he was the producer on La Bamba. Too. Yeah. Yeah. On La Bamba. And there are rumors that he actually directed La Bamba. Oh, really? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. I, I did ask him about that. What did he say? He, he didn't say anything. Well, not the directing. He didn't say anything about that, oh, but okay. just how he was involved Yeah, and how he's like really good friends with the uh, Louis, Louis, Louis Valdez. Valdez. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got to talk to him about it and he's <laughs> definitely an advocate for, for, yeah. uh, for us. I think yeah. he, he seems very, yeah, like legitimate. Like, mm -hmm. I guess he kind of grew up with a, a lot of those people and kind of knows like what's David up. Ayer. And, David Ayer, same right. thing. Yeah. yeah, and he knew to get, you know, he talks about when he did the movie, like it was really important to get the right people in because right. who am I to like tell this? So, you know, I, I'm going to do it. Which is rare for a director right. to have, especially a uh, Caucasian director yeah. directing a Chicano cultured mm -hmm. story to have that um, humility yeah. to do that. yeah. To get someone like, well, we need Jimmy Santiago Baca, who who's lived this, who can who can write it and make right. it for us. Um, who I did have on the show. I don't know if you've seen that. I didn't episode. see that one. No. I yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link. I'd that was from a, that from a few years ago. He lives in Arizona, so we did it over Zoom. But he talks about how he's writing Blood and Blood Out too. Right, I've heard that before. Stuff. I've heard it. Yeah, I was like, oh wow, this is crazy. I, if I was better at the social media thing and playing the game on YouTube with thumbnails and right. hooks, then I guess maybe I would have blown up that video. It's like Blood and Blood Out too. Exclusive. Oh, you absolutely would. Uh, would yeah, blow out. absolutely. Too bad I'm just not really. <laughs> you got to learn it though. That, I mean, yeah. you and me both. Yeah, uh, a lot of connections I've made in the business have been through social media. Yeah, and um, if you're not a, a creep and you have a decent amount of work. Um, people reach back, yeah. you know, um, it's not like back in the day where you have an office and secretary to get past, right, you know right. what I mean? Like, so I always reach out to Latinos in particular, if they, mm -hmm. if they, in our business, if they talk a lot about diversity and inclusion and helping everyone, I reach out to them first. Yeah. More times than not though, they're the ones doing the least behind right. the scenes. <laughs> yeah. Just all the, all the virtue signaling. Yes. Yeah. That's a good, good way of saying it. That, that is the great thing, man. Like I, just from starting this podcast, it really taught me, uh, Mezcal 33 Reposada, it really taught me the, um, just the power of asking, you know, like reaching out to like the people I've had on here and talk to and numbers I've got in my phone now, like never would have thought in oh, a yeah. million years, like 
oh, I'm over here having lunch with like Big Puppet and Little Puppet now and like just chatting it up, talking about movies or like randomly. And just, yeah, social media, man. It's but crazy. But it's also it's who like you are. You know what I mean? Right. It's, right. And that's 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 a, a big part of it. Asking and and being honest and being genuine. Right. You know, there's no pretense with you. There's no um, trying to exploit anything from anybody. Yeah. Right. And the glass, uh, the glass cork, too. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, this one I haven't had in a nice. minute, but Reposado, Reposado. Reposado. I don't already. remember how long they aged this one for, but. It's got a little sweetness to it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Picks up kind of that vanilla caramel yeah. note from the, from the barrel, you know, right at the beginning, but at the, but the end is strong, man. Yeah. That stays with you. I know it's a wine thing, but it's got legs too. Yeah. If you see that. What so you're? I mean, you mentioned mescal and rye. Like, is there particular cocktails or drinks uh, that you? Well, like for with? mescal, I love well, neat. I love um, um, Negra Marca. I mean, Marca oh. Negra. Are you familiar with that one? Mm -hmm. um, it's an espadine. Uh, okay. It's very to me. I think it's very complex. Mm -hmm. uh, next time I see you, I'll bring you a bottle. But I usually like to drink that one neat. It's super complex uh, mescal. I use Madre a lot for. Um, oh, yeah for cocktails. So mm -hmm. I usually like to do like a, a mezcal Negroni with Madre, okay. or if I do an old fashioned, but I'll do it with like a quarter ounce of Mr. Black um, and then orange bitters and uh, Aztec chocolate bitters okay. with the Madre yeah. over ice. Nice. Um, but those would probably be my two favorites that I, that I do, you know, but mm -hmm. um yeah, after a while, like I was just bringing home mezcal after mezcal, and my wife was like, you know, I can't taste the difference between any of these. <laughs> and, yeah. I'm like, and I go, after a while, it kind of does that. I think that particular, um, we'll get into rye later, but those are, that's usually what I make, you know? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and I, I usually, if people who like mezcal, I usually will introduce them to that, you know, behind the bar. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, 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 the Negroni is a very, you got two bitter. Uh, right two bitter spirits going at it, you know, being connected by the, by the sweet vermouth. Um, and I usually an, use Antica for that, but, um, I think it's just delicious. I think it's, I, I like something strong, you know, yeah. small spirit forward cocktails. Yeah. So it's funny as my first Negroni I ever had, I was 22 years old mm -hmm. and you know, you're just not ready for it. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I, I still have not acquired the taste for, for a Negroni. Negroni. No. Yeah, it's just not for me. You're much, you're actually a lot younger than me than you think you are. But I remember me and my, my then girlfriend, now wife, we went to San Francisco mm -hmm. together and we were that couple that wanted to go to a fancy restaurant, mm -hmm. right? So we picked this restaurant in North, uh, North uh, Beach, Italian restaurant where I was like eating veal just to order it, right? <laughs> yeah. And the waiter was so kind. He could tell we were so inexperienced. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget him. He was so kind. And the drink of the day was a Negroni. I didn't know what that was. He's right. telling me everything that's in it. And I'm like, um, yeah, sure, I'll do Yeah, that mm -hmm. sounds good. And he brings it over and it's bright red. <laughs> yeah. And you know, 22, you're like bright red, super sweet. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Took a big old gulp of that, man. And I was like, what did I order? And I drank the whole thing, yeah. but I was not ready for it. <laughs> yeah, maybe someday I'll acquire that taste. But yeah, mezcal, I've been slowly getting into more and more. And yeah, I feel like I'm still in the in the Espadine zone because when you want to move up to like a Pachuga or yeah anything else now you're passing like the three digit number and I think i'm like the, uh, the marca blanc uh, marca negra that'll be your go in between that'll okay, be the bridge yeah. to get you to pachanga pachanga but yeah um yeah i think that's the one you should try okay yeah, yeah I'll, I'll find that yeah it's um like i got a book on mescal recently that i haven't dug into yet because i've just been reading a lot of film stuff but um yeah one day it just it's it's a big hobby. It's a little too much. So I had to like really, <laughs> it's a lot. yeah. I had to back off and like. Well, bro, I, can't I see afford the to stuff you bring bottles. up, man. I'm yeah. like, where the hell are you getting all this? Yeah, I I hunt, man. I so I got really into it when I got my teaching job. I was a high school teacher the last couple of years, so that was the most money I like started making my life. Still right. not a lot, but right. You know, I had a single some, guy. I mean, you're a single guy. You don't, are you yeah. married or have no? Kids? Not married. No okay. kids now. Right. Yeah, so it's um, a decent job, man. Yeah, so I got like pretty into it and really into the hunting so on the weekends man right. i find out which stores to go to follow a bunch of instagrams like i i am i was into it yeah and i got friends that were like just call the store ahead of time i'm like no it's the thrill man of like walking in and i don't want to know it's i gotta like walk in finding action find figures it. when you're a kid yeah <laughs> right yeah <laughs> like yeah. now you can find them anywhere just go yeah. online but like i remember going to toys r us and 
for me was G.I. Joe and finding mm -hmm. the Storm Shadow because the ninja character, white ninja character, was not confined him anywhere. And then right. finding him, it's the same thing. It's yeah. absolutely the hunt. Absolutely. Yeah, Love that. So for you and your, your filmmaking, to, to kind of segue into that, I mean, when did you... I guess, did, did you always love movies? Did you know from like being a, a young man, teenager, kid that you wanted to be a filmmaker? Are you a film school person? How did it, how did it all begin for you? You know, I, I was, I did, I did not go to film school. Okay. Uh, my journey was very like this, right? Yeah. Um, but I would say this, I've always loved films mm -hmm. and I could always connect. I always saw films, even as a kid. Well, let, let me just say like the first movies I saw as a kid, my dad would introduce me to the movies like The Godfather, mm -hmm. Apocalypse Now, The yep. Deer Hunter at seven years old. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in the 80s. It was a little different time then. Um, so he would introduce me to that. My mom, on the other hand, would introduce me to things like West Side Story and mm -hmm. Yankee Doodle Dandy. Um, and um, the um, God, one of my favorites, Oliver Twist, you mm -hmm. know, like musicals. But I really enjoyed them. And so I've always been a lover of movies. Raiders of the Lost Ark is my all-time favorite movie of all time. It's my best. It's my favorite film. Um, to this day, I still want to be Indiana Jones. Ha have you ever, sorry to, to interrupt, no, no. but have you ever seen the um, the, adapt the, in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, the adaptation? The uh, DVD yes, the or recreation? The yeah, by those kids yes. that spent like the five years making it. The documentary of it. And the documentary. Oh, my God. It was, it was heartbreaking, though, because he made it while his parents were divorcing. Was that how I, the story? I think so. There, yeah. There's a whole point where, like, the two best friends kind of split yeah. up. But I love that, you know, then The Last Crusade came out, and they're like, all right, let's, let's go watch this together. Yeah. And then after seeing it. It was so amazing that they're like, we got to finish this. Finish like, we got to and then they, come back together and make the movie. Everyone and, should watch that movie. That yeah. if anything ever discourages you, watch that film. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. It's an inspirational <laughs> film. Of course, I've seen it though. Okay. Um, yeah. But one thing I don't know if you've seen that um, Steven Soderbergh did. It might still be on his website. Mm -hmm. He took Raiders of the Lost Ark, and it's a great film school. He made it all silent. Mm -hmm. Then he made it all black and white. And then he put a Trent Reznor soundtrack under it. Oh, really? Score under wow. it. So watch that because he was saying it's a perfect film. You don't even need dialogue yeah. for it. You know, yeah. the way that Spielberg composed every single shot, yeah. every single movement, it's it's flawless. And you don't see it. Yeah. You know, it's not like, well, I don't want to mention any other filmmakers, but there are filmmakers who can get those shots, right? Yeah. But you're aware of it. Mm -hmm. Like, you're not aware of how great and how difficult it is for for Harrison Ford to walk into his light and just have yeah. the eye you know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? yeah, and right. make it look like it wasn't planned. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They, uh, he, they deliver a lot of information about Indiana Jones and who he is before he says a word, just all the opening credit stuff of them getting up to the idol back to and the, everything. Yeah. yeah. Just, he's kind of silhouette all the time. Love it. Like you, you learn so much like, yeah, just through the visual. So that I got to check that out. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And it might still, it was a while ago, probably over 10 years ago, but I think it's still on his, his website, his personal website. That's cool. I'll, I'll try and wow. find the link and send it to you. But so I've always loved movies. Um, and then I had, I remember when I was probably around 10 or 11, I produced like a little, show variety show in my garage when I grew up in Wilmington in the Harbor area. Cause I was this summer, I was bored. I was bored. There was nothing to do for kids at that time, especially growing up in Wilmington. So that was probably the first time I produced anything and did anything creative. Mm -hmm. And then I had changed schools and became very introverted and didn't do anything creative again until I took a Shakespeare class in high school. And I thought I wanted to be an actor. So my dad had found, I wanted to go to school outside of Wilmington, and my dad had found an acting academy at the at LA City College, Los Angeles okay. Theater Academy. So he says, if you're serious about it, maybe this is something you should take a look at. I didn't know what Tisch was or NYU or USC. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any of that, right? I just know I wanted to go out of Wilmington. So I started taking, I got into the program. I auditioned. I was terrible, but I still got into the program and started taking acting classes. And it was an intense program for three years. Like you couldn't work. It was like 9 okay. a.m. till midnight. Yeah. And that's where I met my girlfriend, now wife, of you know, been together a long time. And that kept me there. But I started directing a little bit there. And then when I graduated, me and her started producing plays. And I just mm. would put myself in because I know I could depend on myself. And I would get 
actors. I was producing without knowing I was producing. It was just like, what do we right. got to do to get everything together? Yeah. Rent a theater. And then I started writing. You know, we couldn't get ro royalties for certain plays we wanted to do. So I just started writing. So all that kind of came out of necessity. And then when I finally made the realization that I'm not a good actor and was when I, I did my first film, which you're not going to find on IMDb or anywhere. It was There was some really good stuff about it. It was about a grandfather and a grandson. <laughs> and um, I made that film over two years. I was the lead in it. Um, and it went nowhere and it did nothing, but uh, it was my film school, okay. essentially. And it didn't put me in the poorhouse too much. I mean, the funny thing about that was me and the wife got married in 2000. We started shooting in June of 2000. We started shooting that film in September. Okay. So I had about $4,000 left after our wedding. Um, and I told her, I'm gonna give you the wedding that you want, but we're gonna be broke for at least the next two years. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any kids. I was bartending at night and um, I was doing some touring, acting gigs here and there, theater gigs. So I had a, a decent amount of money to, to pay for, it, for, my, for a mistake, right? Okay. And at the end of that process, um, I always tell people, you're not a filmmaker until after you do your uh, second film. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that, and it pisses a lot of people off, is if you've done one feature, and after all the pain and sacrifice and failure, mm -hmm. if after that you go, fuck, I got to do that again. Right. You're a filmmaker. Yeah. Right, <laughs> you know what right. I'm saying? Yeah. Most people I know that have done at least one film, mm -hmm. they're like, I'm never doing that again. Because they were they were thinking Sundance, they're thinking yeah. million dollar deals, they're thinking I'm gonna get rep by CAA, I'm gonna mm -hmm. win this award, that award, right? And that doesn't happen, and they're not gonna put themselves through that again, you know. So they're a one and done. I call them a one and done filmmaker. Yeah. Um, but after that process, I was really hungry to do to do more. Mm -hmm. But again, I didn't have any money. That film went nowhere. I didn't film, screen at any film festivals. I shot it digitally on a Canon XL one. Okay, I was going to ask yeah. that if you if you spent the money on the film or if you if you I bought did a the camera. digital. Okay, uh, I still have that camera. Yeah, and yeah. at that time the XL ones were still what like four thousand dollars. I like got that? it. I what I figured out was if you bought it in New York at BNH Photo Video online, they uh, you didn't pay a sales tax. Oh, so okay. I got it for like thirty seven hundred, mm -hmm. and um, and then they shipped it to shipped it to me. Uh, so I took a big chance. Like I this yeah. is this is two thousand internet. You right. know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, what did I just do right now? And you know, there's naivety is a, is a, is a, I tell people is a, uh, when you're first starting out is a strength. Yeah. You know, um, it becomes a liability. Your experience becomes a liability later because on my seventh film, I was making it knowing it wasn't distributable, mm. but I had to make it anyway. And that's the Marigold, the matter. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, and the smartest thing I did with that was when I finished it, I just hung on to it. I mm -hmm. was like, there's no platform for this right now. Mm -hmm. And then Tubi came along and I was like, that's where my film is going to be perfect for, you know, because our people watch Tubi yeah, because it's free. Right. It's ad, what's well, ad, ad supported. Um, and so I was able to use an aggregator to get that film on, but yeah, so that's sort of how my journey started. And then I did The Misadventures of Cholo Chaplin, which is a series of shorts, and I shot them on Super 8. I had bought, there it is. Yeah, thank you. I had bought a, um, I bought my own editing system. It was mm -hmm. Final Cut 2 at the time. So I already had my own editing system. So yeah. I would take all the Super 8 footage, I would convert it at a lab, and I would edit it digitally. You know, mm -hmm. and I think... Oh, yeah. I ended up submitting to Project Greenlight when it first came out. Okay. And we made the top 25, I think. I don't remember. That was like when, when you would upload your, your film and it would take like all day. Right. And it was a three-minute <laughs> film. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's how it started, man. I just And it's been a lot of ups and downs, a lot of starting over. Um, yeah. You know, uh, it's been a long, hard, lonely journey. Um, but I just love making movies and I've got a partner that is too, almost too supportive. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I, I thought it was interesting what you said about um, how like when you're young, the na naivety can be kind of a strength. Like there's a good interview with Orson Welles where they, he says something similar. They talk right. about Citizen Kane and you did all these things and you um, kind of invented a new way of like right. how he shoots telling movies. the story. Yeah. yeah. And he just says, uh, ignorance. He's like, I just didn't know what I was doing. That's what I loved about yeah, him because that. he has such this air about him. Yeah. But when he really talked to him and it's a good interview, I know the interview yeah. you're talking about, 
um, it was the same thing. Another thing he said in that interview, the, uh, and I loved it, was he said, the interviewer asked, have you ever cast your friends in your movies? And he goes, frequently. He's mm -hmm. all, have you ever regretted it? He's all, frequently. <laughs> <laughs> And one thing he said, which is very interesting, and this is Orson Welles, who's considered one of the, who directed one of the greatest films ever made right. in Citizen Kane. He said, that he said, well, well, then why did you do it? He says, because my fr the friendship was more valuable to me than the, the film. Mm. He's all, the film is not precious. It's what I love to do, and I like to tell stories, but the friendships are, are worth more to me. Yeah. And I was like, that's coming from Orson Welles. That's pretty wild. There's got to be a balance, obviously. Right. But, uh, I'm not going to put someone in front of the camera who can't do it. Yeah. You yeah. know, because um, I get asked a lot by a lot of people who can't do it. So you hurt people's feelings sometimes, but you, it really what serves the story, but it doesn't have to be precious. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, I'm not one of those, you know, and, everyone, I get, and, and I'm glad you haven't asked that question yet. Maybe you were, but like, what are your influences? You know, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't have the same influences as everybody else of my contemporaries. You right. know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I don't worship at the altar of any particular filmmaker. Mm -hmm. There are a couple that I go, I don't know how they do what they do. And I look up to it and I try to not emulate it, but find my way of getting that result. Yeah. You know, so for me, it's like a Jim Sheridan whom in all his films, it's just, I, I, the acting is on a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. It does, it's, it does, it's not even acting anymore in my opinion. And I don't know how he, he does it where it's like a fly on a wall type you know, and you say Jim Sheridan, people don't know who you're talking about, you know, but he's worked with Daniel Day-Lewis three times, you know, okay. he's done The Boxer, he's done um, In the Name of the Father, In America is one of my top films, 10 films of all time. Uh, Brothers was a freaking hard movie to watch. Some of his movies are really hard to watch because they're so human. Okay. Yeah. And they, they'll mess up your whole day. <laughs> yeah, all right. I'll go, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. I, I got to be honest. I'm not familiar with that name. So. I'll but he's an Irish, he's an Irish filmmaker. He was mm -hmm. backgrounds the theater. There's a lot of similarities between the Irish experience, Irish Catholic experience and the Mexican experience in this country. Yeah. He had a family and came here with nothing and was doing plays and trying to support his family and and uh, pursue his dream. Yeah. I think that's why I connect with his stuff as, mm -hmm. as much as I do, because I didn't know all that till way after right. you know, I started watching his films. So there is just something about his movies that speak to me. So how did you get to the, the point where, I mean, so you made that first feature that you know, like you said, isn't really out there. It was for you. That yeah. was your school. You did your shorts, Cholo Chaplin. I mean, clearly you got into festivals and it made some rounds, yeah. you know, and I, I guess what was that next step? Like from there, how did you go about, I guess, getting money to, to do it, do it again, you know, yeah, and kind of no, step it up? I, well, after I did, well, the thing with Cholo Chaplin, when I first did it, I had one 13 minute, um, short that was shot on super eight, but edited digitally. Mm -hmm. And I submitted it to all the film festivals and it got rejected at all the film festivals, everything. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, what do I got to do? I realized later about film festivals, but I couldn't get any heat on it. So I ended up doing another episode and another episode because I could afford to do that without, you know, going broke doing it. And I thought they were different. I thought they were original. And I got into one Latino film festival who wanted to put it in an experimental short okay. film. I'm like, they're silent shorts. Like, this is, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like, not like avant-garde. It's not. Yeah. Like, yeah. It takes place in the Day of the Dead. All the characters. This would be way before Coco, right? right. Way before. <laughs> I didn't need any uh, authenticity consultants on, on yeah. my set either. <laughs> uh, but And I love Coco, but, I, but I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> but uh, I ended up, I had like five of them. I had them all on DVD. And there was this thing called the Short Film Corner in... Um, at con it was in its third year i think mm -hmm. and we submitted and we got in and i was excited and it wasn't until i got there that i realized that i think they pretty much let everybody in oh okay but it was still a great thing it was all these short filmmakers at con, at con and they had pitch meetings and things like that but i mean you really i really got to learn the business of movies being there because the red carpet that like access Hollywood and all that, all the screenings there, that yeah. is the smallest part of con. It's a festival. Right. So there's all these pavilions and there's great networking and workshops and stuff like that. And Peter Broderick, who is a champion of independent filmmakers, he was a consultant for independent films in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. I, I think he's still around, but he's helped a lot of filmmakers. He did a workshop and I'm like, me and my wife, I go, we got to go to that one. So he'd go and he was talking about a f short film called The Tribe. 
that this woman was able, filmmaker was able to monetize. And it was a sh- like 20 minute short film about, uh, it was called The Tribe. I think it was about her family, her Jewish family. And she was putting it on YouTube and she was able, and this was before you, you could monetize anything on YouTube. This is before anything was kind of viral, right? And no, no, she, what she did was she put it on a DVD and then she did a website for it. She handed it out to synagogues and like her community okay. and they saw themselves in her film. So they started buying it. So I went and talked to him. I told him what I had and I had like, m- like really crude marketing materials for Cholo Chaplin. He says, don't put it on YouTube. He's like, what you need to do is put them all together in a DVD. Go talk to, I think they're called Breakdown Distribution. He's like, they're here. Go talk to them. So I said, okay. So I went to go talk to Breakdown Distribution. I showed them what I had. And they're like, this is what we provide. We we will mass produce your DVD. You give us the artwork. We'll create a DVD uh, cover for it. And then we store them in our warehouse. And then you could use our link to uh, put on your website. And people can buy it directly. Hmm. So that's what I started doing. And I was, you know, if I was like, okay, oh, where can I see your project? You can buy it here. And I did okay. I, I made my money back on it. Um, but this is making my money back on short films in 2009, 2000, yeah. actually 2007. So then I had this whole great package. And my best friend did the DVD cover. I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to every film festival in Los Angeles that rejected them. And I'm just going to pass them out in their lobby. <laughs> nice. So I took it, I started passing them out and like, oh, are you, this is cool. You're in the festival. I'm like, nope, I got rejected by this festival, but hey, yeah. take my movie anyway. There's five, <laughs> five shorts in there. Oh, okay, cool. Cause they costed me, ended up costing me like a dollar 50 each. Okay. You know, cause I did like 2000 copies. Right. Yeah. And um, so I would take like a hundred of them just out of the warehouse and just pass them out. So I was doing that and it got in the hands of a distributor who was trying to get into production. Mm-hmm. So he loved it. And he's like, where can I buy, you know, where are you at? What stores are you in? I go, I'm not anywhere. He's like, well, how did you get the, you know, it was a professional looking thing. And he's like, well, we want to distribute it. We can get you in the stores. And I'm like, great. I go, it's only 30 minutes long though. They're like, well, what if you give us all your footage? Can we got to get it up to 90 for our buyers? And I'm like, there's no way. Even my right. raw footage, like there's just no way, right? <laughs> yeah. I, go, I appreciate it. I'm excited, but this is it, you yeah. know? And he says, well, what feature films do you have? And I said, well, I'm writing um, a trilogy of uh, urban films that I called The Drive-By Chronicles. Mm-hmm. And the first one is done. It wasn't. But I go, the first one's already done. So he said, can you send us a script? I go, in a three weeks, I can send it to you. And he says, okay. So I sent him the script, and they loved it. And they said, we're going we're gonna to produce three films, and yours is going to be the second film. And I said, great. But all I could hear was they were going to produce three films. Mm-hmm. So I was like, how do I get those other two? Right. And luckily, the other two filmmakers they were working with were already Martin Scorsese and Quentin Tarantino in their heads. Okay. Um, so their scripts weren't ready and they kept giving them notes and they didn't want notes on it. And they just, they mm-hmm. didn't want, how do I say? They were just arrogant. So I sent them my script. I go, we're going to bump your script up to know first and then we're going to do their second and third film with those other filmmakers. And I said, okay, I go, well, this, I'm going to, we'll do this one. I go, but it's actually a trilogy. And they said, what do you mean? I go, well, they all start and end with a drive by shooting. And then we get the story in between. Mm -hmm. And they really liked that idea. And I had written the first 10 pages of the second one. I sent them that. They said, you know what? We're going to do all three with you. Nice. Okay. So it was like over, it was a whirlwind. It was like over, 18 months, almost, or 20 months, where I did all, all three. It was okay. like one right after the other. And after my third one, I mean, so that's, I don't, I'm monologuing now, but that's how I got my first three films, mm-hmm. was <laughs> taking my short films to film festivals that rejected me and passing them out to anybody that would take one. And one of them happened to be a producer distributor. Man, amazing. That, that's, that's one of those really good stories that is. <laughs> That I think we all like hope is gonna is gonna happen. You know? Yeah, and it can it comes yeah. out of a lot of rejection. Yeah, you know, and I, th- I thought it was funny. So drive by memories that we mentioned um, yes. earlier, the the little short documentary I made on Daniel Vita Real, like got rejected. It probably six or seven festivals. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get it in the any festivals. That's why it took me so long to finally just put it on YouTube. You know what though? Let <laughs> me say this because I saw that documentary. Uh-huh. And, and I've been on, I've been on selection committees for film festivals. Mm. Um, 
you had 81,000 last time I checked, 81,000 views. Yeah. I guarantee you, you got more views off of that yeah. than if you had gotten into every single film festival that you mm -hmm. got rejected from, you got more views on it that way. Yeah. You know, and beyond that, you know, it's talk a little bit about it, man. It's really freaking good. Oh, I appreciate that. I really yeah. enjoyed it. I thought you told a great story. It didn't feel like 25 minutes or however long it yeah. was. Daniel's a a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. You did this kind of ride along thing with him, yeah. but it wasn't distracting. Mm -hmm. And he's such a, 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 he's got this sweetness about him yeah. that you really captured. You didn't invoke yourself into it. Mm -hmm. You didn't put Daniel on a pedestal. You just told the story, yeah. but the editing of it, it broke my heart at the end. Like I love when he was like talking, yeah, when I grew up at the very beginning, it's like, I didn't, when I grew up, you know, we didn't, the bridges weren't that big of a deal. Yeah. <laughs> and now the sixth street bridge. Yeah. And then you end it with him driving on the sixth street and going, Oh yeah, it's nice. Yeah. It's a nice bridge. Like, <laughs> yeah. cause I love the, the new, I love the old one cause it's uh -huh. in my last film. Yeah. But I love the new sixth street bridge. I yeah. love it. And, uh, but it was really well done, man. And you got to get better with the social media stuff because that's <laughs> yeah. part of the problem is, and you've seen it, man. Like, and my wife sees it too. Like the people that are talking the most and this, that, mm -hmm. man, they don't have the work, man. Yeah. They don't have the work. <laughs> it's funny. My, my friend um, who I've been shooting little shorts with, uh, who lives here. Thank you, Carissa, for letting us use your apartment. Um, you know, w we were having this conversation recently because we're trying to, you know, we recently actually pitched a feature that she wrote and we did a proof of concept short to uh some line producers I know that work for Miramax for Kine. And um, so it was pretty cool, but you know, it's the, the, um, what do you call it? almost a chicken egg thing of yes. like, you know, we, we really love the concept, but you guys don't have feature credits. You know, you gotta, you gotta do that. And it's like, well, but we're trying to do it. Right. right. You know, but so we're, we're figuring out like what we can just make on our, on our own. But she said something similar to what you just mentioned, you know, we're talking about people on social media and how there's a certain amount of delusion I, you, I think you kind of have to have, you know, and maybe that's a bad way to put it, but just this, I think there's a lot of delusion out there. I, I, I don't know. Like people talk, they're really loud, whether they can deliver or not. Right. You know, but then they're put in the position because they're so loud where maybe they'll get the chance to either sink or swim. I don't know. I would probably say not rare, rarely well, does but, that happen because I think yeah. most of those people are they're pursuing notoriety. Mm. They're not necessarily interested in making a movie. They're right. interested in telling people they're making a movie. That's the difference. Yeah. Right. You know, and yeah. it's hard. I don't want to, I don't want to back. Cause sometimes these people reach out to me, mm -hmm. you know, and they're so used to everyone going, Oh my gosh, you're this, that, and the other. Cause right. most people don't pay attention. Mm -hmm. And I always look underneath. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like one of the things I always say is when it comes to whatever you're doing, but, specifically filmmaking, when it's all said and done, never let more be said than done. Mm. You know what I mean? If yeah. you're talking more about something than, and you don't have the work to back it up, mm -hmm. I'm already lost interest because I'm the one that does that homework. Right, right. That's why you don't see me in a lot of certain places. And someone will ask me, Ken, I never see you at this conference or this organization or this film festival. I'm like, because those aren't rooms where anybody can do anything for anybody. Yeah, It's all just a, a big everyone patting themselves on the back mm. and getting their picture taken on a red carpet. It doesn't interest right. me at all. I go, I have two places in the world that I want to be on set and with my family. That's mm -hmm. it. You know? Um, and sometimes behind a bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, I'm going to pour some of this rye now. See how I, I, I said <laughs> yeah. like that? Like I was ready for yeah. the rye. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Great. So this one is uh, Nelson Bros Rye. This dropped fairly recently, like several months ago. They okay. released this. Nelson Bros is from Nashville, Tennessee. They are friends of the show. They actually sent me this bottle, which was really nice. Thank you guys. Oh my gosh. But yeah, this is probably like 30 bucks. It's pretty easy to find right now. I think 90 proof, 90 so proof, 92.5 proof. Wow. Great uh, rye for yes. an old fashioned, this one. Oh, wow. Some yeah. corn in that man. Yeah, a little bit. This yeah. is one that I get a little bit of like a orange citrus on yeah. sometimes. Yeah, um, that's a sweetness there. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's a it's a it's a pretty light rye. Like this is one I like to now. What once I finally taste it, I'm like, this is a good one for people that don't have a lot of experience that's with a rye. Good intro rye. Yeah. yeah. I recently, if I go to Seven Grand or Bar Jackalope, now my go to is this in an old fashioned. Oh, like wow. you, usually, I like a really high proof bourbon right. in an old fashioned because i like to like taste you know the, the spirit the above everything yeah here. yeah 
I love that. But the, this one, man, it's so refreshing. Just it works really well. I don't know if there is such a thing, but it's like a summer rye. Yeah, no, yeah. That's exactly how I would describe yeah. this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Because there's not a lot of rye I like to have in hot weather, that's for sure. Mm hmm. This one definitely is. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I love the. Uh, the title of the show uh, on the on the <laughs> thank McLarens. You. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah, that's nice, man. But yeah, it's um, and that can be a distraction, you know. And that's also the heartbreaking part of it. For I see people like yourself doing something interesting, mm -hmm. you know. And like you said, I don't know how the hashtag. I don't know how to do all that stuff, and I don't either. Mm -hmm. um, I just post, and hopefully, people find an interest. And yeah. sometimes that works too. But I think with what you do, like. I would, it would it would be worth it to take a workshop or figure it out because yeah. what you do first of all that doc got eighty eight thousand or eighty five thousand views without any of that yeah right and that's because a people are fans of Danny Rivera mm -hmm. Al, but also you told the story really well yeah and the fact that you didn't get into a, a festival just <laughs> actually because I don't do a lot of film festivals and when yeah. I tell people that like, oh you're just bitter because you don't get into them I go no it's not that it's just they're really not they're, they're really irrelevant in terms right. of my goal always is to get distribution right you know and so I, I i can do my own screenings you know what i mean like if, if that's what i want to do i go but also in this age you don't really need a film festival yeah. and the reason that people go to film festivals now is just to get their picture taken on a red carpet or get, get an award get the laurel the laurel yeah, yeah. And like i mean i remember this one because i like I don't know, 100 laurels on his short film. I'm like, what is it? Have you done another short right. film since, bro? Yeah. You spent all your money going to film festivals. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, do the next thing. It's not one thing. It's never one thing. It, it's a body of work, you know, and getting the work out there. That's it. And reaching out to people who mm -hmm. can get you to that next step. Yeah, I, I thought it was like, I'm definitely not bitter about it. I just thought it was kind of funny. And when I I'm saw bitter about it, because it's really good. And I've seen a lot <laughs> yeah. of crap at all these film festivals. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess I try to be like, you know, <laughs> I mean, the, the, I think the biggest bummer, um, was cause it was a lot of like Latino film festivals and stuff yeah. too, where it's like, all right, this, this has got to work at least like maybe these other big ones won't, but I, I find this that, to some degree. And I, I, yeah, I, I no find one, that those of us that are doing it and we get, it, it's actually a, a good sign if a Latino film festival is rejecting your work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it means it's good <laughs> and it means that, you know, I, I, look, a lot of these film festivals already know what their programming is, yeah, you right. know, they're, they're taking money from people who don't have any ins in the film festival. Right. You know, every film festival I've screened at, when I really look back on them, we're all through invitation, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but there, and so there's a great one though in Denver that you should submit to. I don't know if you have, I know you've released already, but they, my films have been released and they've screened them there. Mm -hmm. It's the Chican Indy, uh, film festival okay. there. They do plays and they do a film festival and they just treat their people, the, the, the filmmakers really good. It's a just, I loved it. It was Den the Denver, it's in Denver. I'll send you a link. Mm -hmm. You should apply, um, I don't even know how I got, uh, how I even got there. Like, I don't know how they found my stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I just found it ironic that I had to go to Denver to show my work when no Latino film festival in LA has ever shown my work. Right. Right. So, but and that's interesting. Yeah. Like, that's but, really like, even but like, really do I need your, it? Your like my yeah, stuff's sure. on Tubi, Amazon prime. Yeah. I'm working with Academy award nominated actors like Steven Bauer and yeah. popular actors like Danny Trejo. And yeah, like, uh, <laughs> that's why I always say like, I don't need it. You know, yeah. like what, what do they really do for me? Nothing. Yeah. You know? So. Well, yeah. I mean, ultimately, cause I, I know for, for me and it seems like you're living this correct me if I'm wrong, but. I mean, you said it, you want to be on set or be with your family. Like I would love to just be able to live and just make the movies yes, and then hopefully make absolutely. good stories, That's you know, the goal, without right? like, it's not about fame or laurels or like you said, awards and red carpets. It's like, let's just make some cool movies That's it. and be able to live doing that. But yeah, I mean, so I watched Counterpunch, the oh, wow. one you mentioned. That's that, right. Yeah, yeah, you did. Wait a minute. I got to ask you though, mm -hmm. because you had posted that you're watching it, but you had my poster. Did I? I, you didn't, I think I just went to Google and typed really, it in. and yeah. that was the poster that came up. Uh huh. Because there's a story behind that. But go ahead and okay. go ahead and. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just gonna ask because yeah, I saw. I was like, all right, Steve Bauer, that's pretty cool. Scarface, you know, recently Breaking Bad, Better Call Hell Saul, yeah. you know, uh, uh, yeah, Danny Trejo in there, and for that was what your fourth or fifth feature at that at at that point. That was my fifth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It like up to that point was at the 
first movie where you had like n- pretty notable like actors like that who had been around for a while. And yeah, was it, it, was, it was definitely my it's definitely my biggest okay. film, probably my most polished, most mainstream film. Okay. Definitely like the lead. It's still indie and still has mm-hmm. an indie feel to it, but. Um, the least indie of my movies, I would say. Okay. Um, yeah, it was ambitious. And, um, you know, when I wrote the part with Alvaro, uh, who Alvaro's the lead in it, but it's also his story and he's right. the co-writer. Um, you know, I was, we were talking about this part for the Danny plays his crisis counselor. Mm-hmm. And I had known Danny's story already. Like there's been documentaries and, and, um, books, you know, about it. But I had known that that's how he had started um, as a kind of a counselor for for drug at, for, you know, drug addicts. Um, so I thought if we could get it in his hands, he'll play the part because he's never been given this uh, type of part to play. And um, that was like a pure manifestation of, you know, who'd be great for this is Danny Trejo. And I'm like, well, I don't know how we're going to get him, but let's just write for him. Let's put it out into the universe. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's really... I mean, I can't talk too much about it, and I hate saying that, bro. I know how pretentious yeah. that sounds. But <laughs> I just okay. got a call. I had a meeting today, okay. uh, out of the blue meeting today. It's when you called. To, we're going to start later. It was great about a, pro, a script that was given over two years ago. And I thought that producer had forgotten about me, and she's like, "That we're we're working towards that." I have a meeting. You know, this is going to happen. I've been manifesting this freaking story. It's not something I've written, but I want to shoot it. I want to direct it. So there's movement now. I'm not going to say that it's happening, but at least right. there's movement on that movie that I didn't, wasn't expecting. Mm-hmm. You know, you manifest things and sometimes they happen. Danny Trejo is definitely something that we manifested. Um, Steven was someone we actively were trying to get as well because we wanted to, it's a Cuban story, we want a Cuban icon. Yeah. We tried to get Andy Garcia Oh wow! Yeah. for the Frank part, uh, for the uncle. But Andy's in a whole different level. Andy's day rate was way out of our price range. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't, he's such a mainstream actor. Yeah. He doesn't understand, like our budget for the film, he probably looked at it and got, you can't make a movie for this. Right. <laughs> and there was a lot of that. Okay. And I'm like, well, no, you can. You just never done a movie like this. Mm-hmm. But like, I wanted him to gain weight for the part. I wanted him to shave his head, you know, and gray him up and all. Like, it would have been a great character role for him. I mean, Oscar Torrey was amazing. I loved Oscar's work in that. Oscar always plays the heavy, and this was like a sensitive part Mm -hmm. that he got to play. Um, But that was, you know, those were some of the things that we're pursuing. And yeah, so we, you know, you get, it got to Danny, it got to Steven, and they didn't question, you know, I'm I'm still not a, a director of, note you know what i mean so sometimes their people will be like we don't know who this guy is we're not gonna let you do it Mm -hmm. luckily they love the part so much they wanted to do it and um it was fun like i loved working with both of them yeah yeah no that's great i i think um danny brought a lot of like compassion to that role too and like you said it's it's cool to see i mean i feel like more and more he's doing stuff that's like not the you know, the hardcore kind of gangster, yeah. like throwing knives, like Desperado. So oh, all yeah. that stuff's great. I love all oh, that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But it, it was cool to see um, a movie with just being a, a completely, I mean, I guess in Rob Zombie's Halloween, he was kind of maybe like that. Right. Too. He was the orderly guy. But, but um, yeah, that kind of mentor, very compassionate, like, and the fact that he didn't have a similar story to that. And so when he's talking to that character about, yeah, I used to box, I was in the, like, it, you know, it's coming from a place of reality. Yes. You know, I think, and it, I think it really works for the for the well, movie. Well, all every all of his stuff was all improvised. Really? Okay. Yeah. Wow. I had written about thirteen pages of dialogue for him, and when he came on set, he was so open. And Alvaro mm-hmm. is a great. It's his story. Mm-hmm. So Alvaro is a great. Imp- he's a great actor. He's also a great improv actor. And so I said, "What if we shoot all? Of, we're going to shoot all of Danny's stuff in sequence, mm-hmm. and." I had told my producer I need two cameras that day so we could do the two shot and get a, a, a singles on each of each of them yeah. and at the same time. So my editor has something to cut. But what do you think of us just improvising all this stuff? We'll get so much more out of him. Yeah. And I just let them go. And Danny was so open. And I remember like when he when he was talking about that's a talking about uh, Counterpunch and he mentions yeah. the title yeah. and my producer's like hitting me on the <laughs> arm like he just said the title <laughs> That's great. and it was so organic and he was talking about this and we actually changed the script as he had this punch where you know you you uh, hook off the jab and you don't bring you don't bring the jab back so you hook you 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 jab and then hook yeah right and so he's telling him that and like that was Danny's move when he was in San Quentin mm-hmm. and so I go I gotta incorporate we changed the ending incorporate he wins that way and 
Um, so he just gave us like a bunch of gold and he was just so, and he was doing Machete 2, I think, or maybe Machete 2 at the time. I remember we were on a break and a guy from Oxnard had come down to approve. Danny had custom rims made for his bike. Okay. And so he's like, oh, Ken, come over here. I got to show you something. This guy comes in this giant Cadillac and he opens up the trunk and the two rims and the spokes are Machete's <laughs> on the spokes. And so that was really cool. And, yeah. you know, nobody knew he was there until later, I think it was the second day in the afternoon, it got word out in the neighborhood. We shot that scene in Long Beach. Mm. And th then everybody started coming. And, you know, he'll, he signs autographs. He's, and I actually was asked to present him with an award at the Highland Park Film Festival, mm. like right before COVID in mm. 2019. And so that was cool and getting to talk to him in front of a crowd about his journey. And um, it's just a wild journey, but his yeah. face is made for film. I mean, right, it's just yeah. made for film. Yeah, <laughs> man. I mean, how did you refine your directing style? Because you didn't go to film school. No. You know, you made your your short series. You made your your Canon XL one feature. But I guess how did you? How long did it take you? How many movies in or projects in did it take you to find your groove as a director? Because I think directing is probably way more tough than people think it is. You know, well, I, everything I from the on outside. You. Everything's yeah. on you. You know, if an actor doesn't show up, you can replace them. Yeah. If you've written the script and you're the director and you don't show up or you don't have the answer, mm -hmm. you know, that's a great question, man. I don't I don't I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Uh, I guess it's an openness to learn. It's having you know what it is. It's having I've always had a clear vision. Tarantino has said this, too, and I'm not comparing myself to Tarantino, but someone had told him an experienced filmmaker told him, look, you don't have to know about lenses and light and all yeah, this other right. stuff. You need to hire people who know that. Mm -hmm. The thing you need to be very clear on is your vision. Yeah. And once I've written a script, it's already in my head. I see it on the screen in my head. And so everything I'm communicating is to try to match that screen. Right. Right. So I preface my communication skills with uh, what you call like refinement. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, me and my wife have been together over 30 years. Okay. You don't get to that happily. Right. You don't get to that if you don't know how to communicate. Mm -hmm. And then when my children were born, it's the same thing. Like my kids, from the time they were born to the time they're five, very curious artistic children, mm -hmm. I would get barraged with questions on a daily basis. And I don't have all the answers yeah. with them. On set, what, what, what do you got? What do you got? Right. You got another question? Anyone have a question? Because I have the answer. Um, but it is that having, being able to have a vision, a clear vision, and then being able to communicate that vision to the people that you hire, but also having great instincts and in hiring people. Yeah. Sometimes it's not the most talented Right. You know, the most talented, I'm not going to say which film, but the most talented DP gives me the most problems sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to be very careful. Uh, one DP I'd worked with, we were shooting a scene. The actor's pouring their heart out. He had made an adjustment and the actor was out of focus for about a tenth of a second. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and I didn't call cut because the actor was doing right. an amazing job. So he killed my take and put the camera down. Oh, no. And I said, what are you doing? He says, you didn't see that? And I said, see what? I go, that your, your guy, your, your, your focus puller that you hired was out of focus for about a tenth of a second? He's like, yes. And I said, yes, I don't care. Yeah. The actor is giving, just gave me his best take. Yeah. And you killed it. You know, and he's like, but I don't shoot crap. I don't shoot crap. And I'm oh, like, no. we're not shooting crap here. I go, but you think people go to the movies for the cinematography? And I remember I was vindicated because I remember we went to go, me and my wife, it was probably two years after that experience. I almost fired him. Two years later, I remember seeing Les Mis, the musical Les Mis mm -hmm. with Hugh Jackman. Yeah. I feel bad for the DP on that because that director, th that's such a heavy story. Mm -hmm. And the actors are pouring their hearts out. The, the, the poor DP and the, and, and the, uh, and the, and the focus player are having a hell of a time trying to keep them in focus. Yeah. <laughs> this is a multi, multi-million dollar film yeah. that wasn't important to the DP. And you know what? It wasn't important to the audience. I mean, not, it wasn't important to the director. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't important to the audience because what we were seeing was just raw emotion getting thrown at us. Yeah. Yes, it was out of focus for, at times. It wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. But... I'm an actor's director. I, I, I'm a classically trained actor. I'm not very good, mm -hmm. but I have a, a huge respect for that craft. 
And so when I'm working with people who are trying to get the perfect shot and they could give a fuck about the actors. Right, right. I don't want to work with those people. Yeah, man, crazy. How did you, I mean, and we don't have to keep digging into that, but I guess in those situations, how, how do you handle that? Like when the, when the take gets killed do you try to be very like calm and not let everyone kind of into no i have to let the i have to let the actors know that um they have me as their advocate okay i have to let the producer know that i'm in charge Mm -hmm. and i have to let that dp's crew know that this is my movie right you know what i mean Mm -hmm. because i know that if i fire him all his crew's gone too right you know and i've done you know i shot three films in mexico and that's a whole different ball game, man. The crew's there, whole different ball game because they do it 300 days a year. And it is as easy as speaking Spanish to them. Mm-hmm. And it's just boom, 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 boom. Yeah. You know, and I remember when I was on the set of Counterpunch and that was an American crew. And we were shooting in this mansion in Beverly Hills and I could see a cord around a, a, a plant. Okay. And I was really rolling and I saw it. Nobody else saw it, but I did. So I didn't want to stop the flow of my, of every, you know, because everything, everything's flow, everything's rhythm. Right, right. The actors are ready to go. Everyone's ready to go. If I stop and then we get someone to move it, it just becomes a whole thing. Right. Yeah. So I'm like, I ran, I moved it mm-hmm. and I came back action. They do the scene. Everything goes great. Minimal interruption. Yeah. My sound guy who was, a, who was like what I call Hollywood, uh, crew member he says hey man can i talk to you i said yeah yeah absolutely i go what's up and he says oh yeah man you shouldn't do that and i go do what he's i'll move that cable he's like because if you do that then the crew is going to get lazy and they're not they're not going to want to do anything because they're going to be like oh the director will move it Mm. Mm. and i go that's interesting he says why i go because if i was in mexico as soon as i moved to move that cable three guys would have moved it already right there's a certain amount of freedom in shooting in Mexico and it's like the wild west to uh-huh. a certain extent. I can go to the equivalent of Ventura Boulevard and go, I want to shoot here. <laughs> and my, and my producer in Mexico goes, all right. And they start shutting down. The really? Street. Just like that. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> and then because we have a permit and yet the permits there are very loose. You have to have it. Mm-hmm. But once you have it, it's like you show that, you know, and then the cops show up. What are you guys doing? You can't close down Ventura Boulevard. Yeah. There's American. And there I'm an American director. Here I'm a Latino director. But there I'm an American director. And there's a certain amount of prestige that comes with that. But, yeah, they're great. Mexico's like one time my producer had a location. I go, this is this is not going to work, man. This mm-hmm. is just not going to work. And he's like, OK, let me try something else. And we drove, you know. And I see this warehouse. I go, wait, stop right here. Let me see this. I go inside and I'm like, oh, this is perfect. This is perfect. He's like, all right, let me see what I can do. And he goes in and talks to whoever he needs to talk to. He's like, okay, Cam, well, we'll shoot here. And we shoot there for three days. Hmm. You know, so it's, um, it gave me an interesting perspective. Yeah. When, when you're shooting in, say, Mexico, so do you have to hire, like, everybody from there? Or are there, like, key department heads that you can bring hmm. The, Along yeah, well. I hire like grips and mm. even like the uh, focus pullers, like an assistant directors there. Um, but my DP comes from here. Mm. You know, one of the one of my favorite DPs I've worked with, and I've worked with several. I've worked with five. Um, he was my DP on my second film. It was his first time going to Mexico. He was from Cleveland, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Didn't speak a word of Spanish. And my uh, the grips there, there were brothers or three brothers that work on these films. And they loved him. And they just spoke this beautiful cinematic language. They didn't understand each other in terms of English, Spanish language, but they understood each other in terms of cinema. Right. So when I would map out my shot and then Mike would start to light it, you know, the the, the brothers would already, oh, they, he would have just, you know, kind of show them what he wanted. Yeah. And then it was boom, 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 mm. boom. You know, and it got to the point where it was great. It was like, we were shooting something and this is where I didn't mind it. It was like, I'm like, okay, we need to break this down because we're we're gonna move over here. We're done here. And he's like, well, is that what Mike? You know, and he tells me in Spanish, is that what Mike says? Mm-hmm. And I was like, nobody's gonna say that right now. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> right. But I loved it because they had it, he had their respect. Yeah, right. You That's know, good. and they would take. I mean, these guys, they'll do a 16 hour day, go party for another four or right. five hours, sleep three <laughs> hours, show up fresh the yeah. next day of shooting. Um, and I think Mike did that once with them. He's like, yeah, man, I can't do that again. <laughs> I'm like, I go, bro, th- th- I go, you're an amateur. I go, these guys, these guys are pros. Yeah. I go, 
if you want to party with them, party on the weekend. I go, but yeah, because you're going to be hurting the next day. Is, is it a pretty big um, industry of, of workers or like film industry workers out there? Or is it kind of the same people doing all the projects? No, I think it's the same. You yeah. know, when I, I remember they did, uh, and I don't mind bashing this film, but they did the the remake of Miss Bala. They, mm. they shot there. A lot of the people that I worked with worked on that film. Mm. Um, and... I know that they did Selena out there, same mm -hmm. thing. They worked with my casting director. They worked with all. And that's the thing, though. A lot of those, they're trying to do things for cheap, you know, so that's why they go down there. Um, and that's, you know, it was an interesting thing with Selena, this TV show, I remember, like, the very first shot, like, I could tell where they were shooting. Mm -hmm. And where she grew up, it was a very flat part of Texas. Right. And there they had the, the mountains in Ensenada. It was in... Uh, a rosary. I can't remember where they were, but mm -hmm. I was like, there are mountains there. Like right. there's no mountains where she grew up. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, Oh, and then I started seeing names and a few actors that I worked with are there and they would see my crew members that I'd worked with there. And I go, they shot that in Mexico. Really? They're like, yeah. I'm like, I thought they had a bigger budget than that, but hmm. it's a great place for indie films, but Hollywood goes there a lot too. Yeah. To save money. Right. I'm going to pour this next one. If you're Ooh. ready. <laughs> so this one, is uh, Frey Ranch. This is actually from Nevada, so it's 100% rye, oh, no okay. corn, no malted barley, and uh, bottled in bond, 100 it's a proof. Dark, dark rye. Yeah, it, it's a really great one. Uh, Fallon, Nevada. It's actually this husband and wife couple that um, have a farm out there, and I guess it's been like in the generations of that of, okay. the, of the I think the husband's family. And so they just started distilling whiskey. So it's completely like craft, like grain to glass, like nothing is sourced. They grow everything. So from the moment the seeds go into the ground, so what we have here is is all them on site, wow. like not getting it from MGP or anything like that. It's all hundred proof. Yeah, one hundred proof. Nevada, one hundred percent rye. Cheers. Cheers. That smells so good. Oh yeah, that's it. Oh yeah. That's good. You know that's that good, like right. dryness that yeah. comes about? Like that's when I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, that's my rye right there. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And then the sweetness comes at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not for, for being 100% rye, you would think it might be like too spicy, mm -hmm. like a little too overbearing, but it still somehow is just perfectly balanced to me. You feel it. In the, you feel it in the entire mouth. Yeah. Wow. That's nice, bro. That's really nice. I know you. I saw you feature this one. And I was curious about it. Yeah. No, I love introducing people to this this one. I think on... I've never seen it anywhere. Um, You can get these at Total Wine. Okay. I'm not sure if Bedmo has them. Mission Wine and Spirits has them. The wife, my wife would love this one. She would she would drink this all day. Yeah. Wow. they. There's one place I know of, maybe two now, where you can get like a single barrel version of this. So like 120-ish proof. Right. That one is like almost black. Oh, it looks man. like motor oil. That's... um. How much is that by the bottle? I think well, I think Cypress Craft Spirits and um, Cypress California just got cases of their own single barrel pick of it, and it was like one twenty nine ninety nine, which is uh, seems like a little bit much, but maybe I'll go get another one. We'll see. Oh, wow. um, but I think I think the it, most I've ever spent was I uh, I spent eighty or ninety dollars on a bottle of Angel's Envy Rye. Oh, not Angel's Envy Rye. I like that I one, man. It. I love it. That just that yeah. maple syrup pancake Fuck smell. Yeah. <laughs> I pour that on my pancakes, yeah. like that one, and uh, the one, I, the new one that's out that I like is uh, Pinhook. Oh yeah, Pinhook, Pinhook Rise. Yeah, man. I've only tried it once. I've got this a bottle of it. Though. I haven't. Yeah. Uh, opened this is it great yet, though. though. This is yeah. This is really nice. I think on we were talking about you know the you listen to the Predator episode that I did with my friends. I think the single barrel ride, I yeah. think that was the one we did it on. Yeah. And they were all blown away by it. It was like the Jack Daniels single See, I'm gonna, barrel. I'm, I'm, gonna, that's, <laughs> I'm gonna do that. Wow, that's yeah. delicious. another another great one in an old fashioned too. This is delicious. <laughs> There's a bar um called the Edmund on Melrose, kind of near Western. Mm. Melrose and Western, and they have they usually carry this. This was their well for a minute. And what? they they have like the uncut, unfiltered bourbon too. So I'm always like, give me the Frey Ranch old fashioned man. Yeah, Michter's Rye is there well right now, too. Shout out, Edmund. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, man. I'm like, you got Old Granddad as your bourbon. That's great. Oh, oh man. wow. Yeah. yeah. But Michter's Rye is your well? Like, that's the one I'm going to take. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So. Yeah, Jesus. 
Yeah, I we mean, just forget about movies now. Yeah. Like this is it right here. <laughs> no, I'm glad you like it. I just love, yeah, I love introducing people to this. Hell of a bottle too, mm-hmm. man. Like just it's a brick. You got the little uh bronze like cap, whatever that is. Like something like I don't want to say vintage, but yeah. I don't know. And also like, I don't know, it's very elegant as well. Yeah. But this me- this metal top like Yeah, it's a oh, banger, shoot. man. Next time I'm in Nevada, I'm going to stop there for sure. Yeah, I got to visit this place. You know, you talked about being really a bit like actors, director and all that. I mean, I don't know. I guess it's a hard thing to talk about because that's something I definitely need to get better at. You know, I've been reading Judith is a Judith Weston, Judith her Weston, book directing yeah, for absolutely. actors. I'm like halfway through it. Um have you read that or have you even taken any of those workshops so or anything? It's funny that he should ask that, not knowing <laughs> that I'm actually going to be teaching an acting for directors class. Oh, I was going to bring that up because oh, I, okay. I saw you post about it the other day. Yeah, well, I so just, uh, I taken Judith's class I and mean, she's, mm-hmm. she's coached and, and, and taught some, I mean, some amazing directors, like yeah. people that we know, like Inyoratu and Ava DuVernay and mm-hmm. um, her philosophy is very similar to mine. Um, and so when I thought about, I've been thinking about doing a class for a while and it's just, it's just, how can I take what I've learned mm-hmm. and teach directors how to communicate better with their actors? You know, cause a lot of actors I know that work in the business, you know, that's their biggest complaint. The staff directors yeah. don't want to talk to me or they don't care. Right. You know, and I'm not saying you have to coddle actors, but you get more if you can create an environment where they're being vulnerable for Christ's sake. Yeah. It's not an easy thing to do. You know what yeah. I mean? In life we're all trying to hide. Right. The actor is like, no, I'm going to open myself up and mm-hmm. put a camera on me. Yeah. While and it's, and it. it's there to stay like yes. when it's recorded, it's, it's that's out why, there. There's that's no why taking some it actors back. Are like, I can't watch myself. Like right. I get that. I understand that. Yeah. Um, but Judith was somebody that I learned a lot from. She'd retired about nine years ago. Well, at least retired from teaching. She still coaches, but I had posted that I was going to teach a class. And then she had commented, oh. Um, she had came to my second film because a student, an acting student of hers was my lead. Mm-hmm. And so that's how she got to know uh, me and my work. And, you know, she's always been very supportive and encouraging. So I just met with her on Thursday. Nice. And um, she gave me the the newest edition of uh, her, her book, Acting with Directors. I'm, I'm acting for directors. And um, no, no, that's not the title, but the, the, the newest book. And um, she said... Um, so what's your curriculum like? And I explained it to her and I said, you know, I'd love, I would love to pull from some of your books. And, uh, she says, absolutely. You know, you have my blessing. And I, she's like, I think it's amazing. You're going to do that. You're such a great communicator. And, um, so yeah, man, that's, that's moving forward. And I'm hoping to have a spot, um, by this week, I may have a spot by this week in terms of where I'm going to do the class. If that's the case, then I was planning to start this in the fall, I would actually bump it up to the summer and do a summer and fall one. Oh, nice. So um, that being said, though, if this film um, that I'm, I've am i been manifesting for the past two years, well, look, I have like four films out there from four different producers that I'm trying to get made, which everyone gets funded first is the one I'm going to make. Yeah. Um, and this one seems to be closest. Um, if this happens, that could change everything. Okay. But, uh, but you still, you know, what I tell people is you don't wait, man. You got to right. make things happen. And, what ends up happening is something else will come, mm-hmm. you know, but sitting around and trying to wait for it to happen, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. You know, so my thing right now, it's the, the business has contracted big time. I was focused on television directing, which is really a big dream of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's impossible for Latinos that I know that have established television directing careers are not working. So it's the worst time for me to try to get into that. And yeah. I've been, you know, I've been laying groundwork for seven years on that. Yeah. You know, I have a lot of connections now, which I didn't have seven years ago, but they're like, Ken, there's just nothing's being done, you know? And I'm like, that's fine. An independent film is always I can go back to. And last year was an incredible year for Latino independent films. Mm-hmm. I mean, A Million Miles Away came out. Um, Aristotle and Dante came out. Radical came out with Eugenio. Uh, Cassandro came out. I mean, there's a ton of, those are independent films, yeah. you know? So... I always get a little bugged when people are always talking about Hollywood is ignoring us. I'm like, we don't need Hollywood. Yeah. We don't need Hollywood. I go, you guys want validation. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. I go, I don't want validation. I want to be able to make a movie and have people see it. Yeah. I don't care if Warner Brothers is doing it or Three Pass or Mucho Mas. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I just want them to have faith in me as a storyteller and get it out in the world. That's it. 
Yeah. You know, we don't need Hollywood to tell our stories. We just don't. And the constant complaining about we're not in it. Yeah, of course not. It's a culture, you know, and you're not going to change the culture from the bottom up. The only thing that changes culture in Hollywood is massive success. Yeah. You make a movie for $5 million and it makes $250 million. Hollywood's going to start paying attention. Yeah. That should be our focus. That's just how I see it. But I'm in the minority in that. I agree with you one, 100%. 100 you know, it's just you can't be knocking on the door of something and cursing them at the same time. You know what I'm right, saying? Right. And for me, um, you know, I've made seven films outside the Hollywood system. And those Latinos that are inside the Hollywood system don't have a lot of respect for what I've done because I'm outside of the Hollywood system. Mm -hmm. So there's that, too. But my thing is, I'm not going to wait. You yeah. know, it's do what you can with what you have. You know, and I. I remember I did this one panel and I ended up taking it over because I was so frustrated with the complaining that was going on. And I basically said, if I go, does anybody in here have one of these? Mm -hmm. And everyone raises their hand. And I'm like, and you're asking the people on this panel to tell you how to do it. Yeah. Like if I had one of these in 2000, I wouldn't have had to buy a $3,800 <laughs> camera. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's so funny. Like I always, um, think about that. Like right now I've been in this big point with, um, my, my friend that I mentioned about, you know what, we just need to start like making more stuff again, just yes. not be precious about it. Cause yes. what's, what's so funny is it's like, as I gained more and more experience and, and all that, it's like, I want it to be perfect and be right. And this and that. But to the to your point, then I just don't make it because right. oh I don't have this I don't like there's always an excuse. So we've been really trying to get into the mindset. Um, like we've got one little short we made recently that I'm editing. We've got like two more we're planning to do. Great. And it's just like exactly that. Like just don't. We're just gonna do it even if it's not quite right. We gotta do a little improv, whatever, overcome. Just we just need to do it to make it because we enjoy doing it and we have fun. It's like uh, other than yeah, like you said, we just kind of sit here and complain that there's no opportunity or nothing's being But handed, what I you find, know? though, brother, is that if you have good taste, mm -hmm. that's the other thing, mm -hmm. is what is your taste? Yeah. There's that Art of Glass video about taste, right? Some people are not, they're making stuff, but they have terrible taste. Right, right. So I'm telling you, from what I saw from your documentary, you have an eye, you have taste. Mm -hmm. It's just doing it yeah. and doing it without expectation. Yeah. And, but there's a caveat to that. It's a very lonely place to be. Right. <laughs> yeah. But the satisfaction comes from creating something that mm -hmm. nobody told. Like, I'm gonna say, like, I, like I tell everybody, I'm like, the most freedom you're going to have in terms of your creation of a short film or a feature is right now. Because as soon as someone gives you money to make something, guess what? They have an opinion mm -hmm. of how you're going to make that, you know? And luckily, like with Counterpunch, I had two producers that were very, and the second, produ the, one of the producers on Counterpunch is the one that's going to produce, she's, her career's taken off mm -hmm. and she's never forgotten me. She's always like, with this script that she sent me that I want, that I want to direct, she's like, she basically told the writer and, and her partner, like, I'm not doing this film without Kenny. I want Kenny mm -hmm. to direct this film. And I'm perfect for it. And if, if, the movie gods aligned everything, then it'll happen. But she never imposed her will. She knew I had more experience than her. Mm -hmm. So she, her attitude was like, and we had our, you know, we had our creative differences, but she yeah. was always from a point of creative differences as opposed to ego. Mm -hmm. And all my best producers have always been women because the ego doesn't affect them as much. Mm -hmm. They're more of like, what's going to get the job done? Right. And that's where I'm at. I'm, I don't consider myself an egotistical director. That doesn't mean that I don't get upset or frustrated on set. It just means that I'm not in, trying to invoke my, I don't invoke my ego in the creation of what I'm trying to do. Okay, so I just know that I think this is the actor that's right for this, mm -hmm. or this is the right tone for this, or, and, and I'll justify it. It's not just because, well, I'm the director. It has more to do right. with, this is gonna serve the story best. Yeah. And if you have a great producer, their attitude is going to be, okay, I get, I get it, you know. I wanted to go back to real quick, you know, you mentioned that uh, currently you have four, I think you said four projects that are kind of out and yes. whichever one. 
So those are all four separate feature films? Yes. And is that... I mean, you just have a ton of stories in you trying to get out, yes. or is that all? Okay, yeah. <laughs> and it just by design of like planting all the the seeds to get something. Yeah, to happen. it's uh, you know I'm trying to, you know I was upset. I had a frustrating week a few weeks back, and I was you know and and the wife always gives me perspective, and she's like, well, what about this script? Who 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 do you have t- trying to get this script done? And I said this producer. She said, who do you have trying to get this script done? Oh, this producer. Who do you have this trying to get this script? And she did that to me four times. And she's like, okay, and you're, what are you upset about? Mm. She's like, you don't think one of those is going to come through? This was weeks ago. And then I wake up this morning and I have an email from my, one of those producers saying she's moving forward with, Mm -hmm. there's some, there's some movement on the script. Um, because the way that there are, every producer I've worked with, they've had multiple filmmakers that they've that they had, right? Because not all of them are. You don't put your your gamble on one. So when I learned right. that, I was like, mm-hmm. okay, it's not one producer. I got to make relationships with multiple producers, you know. And you have to know it's networking, but it's you have to know who to network with. And I'll give you an example. And he's not going to mind that I that I talk because I talk to him openly about this. There was a great conference called Elevate that happened last summer, um, and uh, an organization called Chicano Hollywood put it on. Okay. Chicano Hollywood is the only organization I put any weight behind because Mm. the guy who runs it, Johnny Murillo, is a genuine guy. He genuinely wants to put people together and teach people. Let's look, it's not just writing, directing, and acting, okay? There's grip, there's editing, there's yeah. lighting, there's all these things, mm-hmm. right? And so he's con- uh, connected with Quixote, who has been doing these workshops. And people are coming from all over the country. Latinos, Chicanos are coming all over the country to learn. He's the only one that I know is doing this. All the other ones, they want to throw a party or they want to give awards to successful Latinos, but there's n- they offer nothing else. Mm-hmm. So, but this is where... I hold the people that want to do this accountable. So he does elevate. He has a bunch of people there that I want to meet in TV and film. So I'm like, Johnny, I'll be there. And he asked me to moderate a panel and has Edward James Olmos, Emilio Rivera, and Luis Guzman. Mm -hmm. It's a legendary panel, right? And I don't get starstruck. So, and I want to ask these guys, you know, different questions. So the, all, these, the, all these producers are there. The producer of A Million Miles Away there is there. Another producer that I've been trying to reach out to is there. I'm like, that's who I'm going to meet. I'm going there to meet people. Right. And these people are out in the audience. They're not in the green room. Mm-hmm. They're in the audience. Yeah. And nobody is talking to them. Nobody knows mm-hmm. that these are the people you network with. Right. So for me, it helped because I didn't have to wait in line to talk to them yeah. and let them know who I was. And I got meetings from it. So this is what angered me, though. So we do the panel with these three celebrities. The place is packed. Everyone's there to ask them a question. And we weren't going to do a Q&A, but Luis Guzman was like, hey, let's open up to the audience. And Johnny didn't want me to do that because mm-hmm. he knew the questions were going to suck. Mm-hmm. And they did. And it was about people getting their friend to videotape them asking a question to Luis Guzman. Oh, okay. And then getting a picture with him on the red carpet. They're network. They're trying to network with these actors right. who can do nothing for them because mm-hmm. that's not what actors do. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Johnny, that's the problem. That's part of the problem is that people think they want to network with celebrities, yeah. as opposed to networking. They don't even know who the producers are that are out there. If I say three pass and I say mucho mas, if you don't know who I'm talking about, then I, I don't. I can't help you. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? These guys are producing films. Now, that doesn't mean that if you reached out to them, they're going to want to do your film. You got to, you know, they, they're very specific about what right. they do, you know, because there are people that I, I reach out to and just say, hey, I like what you're doing. But I know and I just let them know that I'm a director. But what I do is different from what they do. So it's knowing who you are, what you're doing, and then who to network with. Yeah. So it's not just networking. It's knowing who to network with. And television, perfect example. I'm only reaching out to TV shows that are going to look at my reel and go, oh, yeah, that's appropriate. I got a great story for you if you want to hear it. Yeah, please. (laughs) So for TV, um, you know, I don't have an agent. 
So a lot of people are like, how, how have you done your movies without an agent? Independent filmmaking, you don't necessarily need an agent. Mm -hmm. okay. You need relationships with producers. That's it. And a body of work right. that a producer goes, okay, I'm making things similar to what you're making. I can trust you because you're working, right? But television is a whole different beast. You definitely need an agent um, because this business is built on relationships and trust. And a lot of people don't like to vouch for people they don't know because if right. you fail, it makes them look bad. Yeah. So you have to build those relationships a little slower. But like, again, you have to have the work. So I'll tell you my Mayan story since Mayans is off the air. So I read about Mayans happening and I'm excited because it's in my genre. It's in my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And I love Sons of Anarchy and a lot of friends of mine are on that show that are actors. And I thought this is a no brainer. If I can get my reel to the people over there, I can get on this show. So I'm like, how do I, am I going to do that? I don't have an agent. So I have a friend who was a grip and he's a brilliant actor, but he's a grip. That's his day mm -hmm. job. So I call him up and I said, do you think you could get me the, a, a call sheet from Mayans? He says, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so he sends it to me and it's got everybody's number on yeah. there. Kurt <laughs> Sutter, his, his, his assistant, yeah. everybody, every producer, everybody's number. Telephone number and email is on there. So their first two years, I think, or maybe maybe just the first year, there was a Latino showrunner, co-showrunner on there. So he was the first one I reached out to. There were actors that I had worked with or had known me that had worked with him. I reached out to them first. Can you submit my reel to them and just, you know, tell them that, look, this is my genre and I'm a director and blah, 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 you know, the whole thing. Yeah, man, love your hustle. Now, whether or not they did it or didn't do it, I don't know. Right. Um, I just know they responded back to me. But again, actors have very little power if any, in right. this business. But I just wanted an introduction. So I crafted this email. I waited three days before I sent it, because that's the other thing. I get a lot of people reach out to me, and I'm like, this is a terrible email. If you're going to reach out to people, <laughs> learn to craft a badass email, okay? <laughs> so what I do is, when I'm reaching out to someone, is I read it, and I give it a few days. I'm mm. not anxious. I'm not in a hurry. Right. So I read it, I'm like, it's perfect. Send it out to them. I'm going to give them a week to respond. Doesn't respond. I wait another week. I send him a second email. No response. Okay, that's dead. He's mm -hmm. not going to respond. So I'm going down the list, and I see this other producer. And this producer goes back to the love boat. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, I grew up watching the love boat. Maybe I'll connect that way. And they had worked with Kurt Sutter throughout all of Sons. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, let me, let me try him. I sent him an almost identical email that I sent the Latino showrunner. And they brought the Latino showrunner in because it's a Latino, quote unquote, Latino show. Mm -hmm. And they want to, I feel like sometimes that happens to curb any, because uh, Elgin James was, is the showrunner of that, right? Okay. They actually even tried to sell him as a Chicano. He's not. Hmm. I don't mind saying that out loud. That's not a big secret. Um, so I knew not to reach out to him. So they brought this guy in the show. Look, we have, a, we have a Latino showrunner on this Latino show. So I submit to this other producer, he's a white guy, and I'm on my way to work in downtown LA, the bartend. So I send it before I leave. By the time I got to work, he had responded already. Okay. Sent him my reel. He was like, Kenneth, I don't know where you came from, <laughs> but... I love your reel. I've done some homework. He did his homework on me in a half hour already. Like nice. you don't have to go to my website. Just Google my name and you'll find out. You find Film Courage. You find yeah. there's no big secret about who I am. So he says, you obviously would be perfect for this show. Let, let's continue this conversation. I said, absolutely. That's all I'm asking is a meeting. That's all I yeah. want. So it's an exercise in patience because it's not like, okay, you got me. Great. Hire me. It's not like, it's not that at all. Right. It's touching base. Hey, man, saw this episode. He's like, look, we already got all the directors for this season. Mm -hmm. Reach back to me, you know, in this time, and let's see what we can do. Great. So I keep in touch with him, always emailing me back, always appreciative. We've never met in person. To this day, we've mm -hmm. never met in person. So I finally, he agrees. He has sets up, he's going to set up a meeting between me and Kurt Sutter. Okay. Through Kurt Sutter's assistance. This is all of my own hu hustle. Yeah. 
And I'm excited. I'm like, man, I can't thank you enough. Like, I'd love to take you to lunch. We don't. Need, I don't even know what you look like, mm-hmm. you know, and you're doing this. And he's getting a sense of who I am through my emails. Mm-hmm. And I just, the guy seems genuine. He doesn't have to do this. Right. Uh, Kurt's assistant's going to reach out to you tomorrow with a time and, and everything. I'm great. I'm like, finally, I'm going to get on this show, direct this show, this badass show about Chicano bikers. And... Kurt Sutter gets fired the next day. <laughs> no. Oh, so no. I, and to his credit, he, and he's connected with him. So he's like, look, mm-hmm. I'm leaving too. He's like, but what I'm going to do is I'm submitting all your stuff to the showrunner. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, hopefully they reach back to you. They never did. You know, and when you look at that show behind the scenes, there aren't many, uh, there aren't any very few Latino directors, mm. much less Chicano directors, which is what I am. Yeah. But very few Latino directors on a Latino, quote unquote, Latino show. Right. right. Um, so that was disappointing. So I let a year go by. I look up. I go, oh, there's a Latino writer. This guy starts liking my stuff because he's a Raider fan on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And I look him up and he's a writer on, on Mayans. Mm. So I reach out to him and he had been let go. I'm Damn. like, really? They let go of all the Latinos right. on this show? Like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, but I made a, I think I made a genuine connection. We met in person and yeah. I told him my story about that. He's like, oh, that's wild, man. And, you know, I get these, the, the heartbreaking thing about television, bro, is I, I talk to some people and the amount of directors in television that are getting opportunities and don't know what they're doing, it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. Because you're like, how... Like you said, you're, you're getting told, well, you don't have the feature film experience. Mm-hmm. You don't have this. You don't have that. Mm-hmm. And the amount of people that get opportunities in this town and don't have the experience, yeah, it, it is the, I don't know what you call that, the irony of the business, I guess. Right. I don't know what it is. You know, there's a buddy of mine that writer in television in his 40s, finally got an opportunity to write television, wrote on a sitcom, was excited been wanting to do this his entire life. Mm -hmm. He has a co-writing credit with a 23 year old who graduated from Tisch. Not even sure if this is what she wants to do. Wow. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Shit. And I'm like, brother, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, we're right working. And she's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm like, it came so easy to her because she graduated from an elite film, elite school, right? And they have all these programs. And those are pipelines. They're all mm-hmm. pipelines yeah. to the business. What, yeah. Which one is Tish, by the way? Tish right. is in New York. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, if you're a writer, if you're a Latino writer and you go to there and it, uh, as difficult as that is, mm-hmm. you probably, if you have a desire to write in television, you're going to, you're going to get, you're going to get a gig right out mm-hmm. of college. Okay. Um, because though they, you have to have that kind of elite status to get, something right out of school right and all i used to have the belief that just do the work and you'll find your way but there really are pipelines that will get you there because when i meet someone who's been when i meet someone who writes about real people and i can tell they've never had a real job Mm -hmm. um you know they went to a really great school right you know i mean i would say most of the la stories that get done they're written by people that didn't even grow up here. Yeah. And they're directed by people that didn't grow up here. And that's that's really the hard uh, reality of our business. Yeah. It, <laughs> it's so crazy. <laughs> I right? know it like sounds discouraging, <laughs> but some of us slip through. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so crazy because you, you would think, especially being out here like in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, like – why? Yeah, I don't know. That's, no, I mean, I've bizarre. been on sets before. I mean, I always I always uh, go to a, an article that Chris Rock, or I don't know if it was an interview or an article that Chris Rock wrote in The Hollywood Reporter about 10 years ago. And he was saying, he had a great quote. He's like, you have to make an effort to not hire a Mexican in this town. I, I, yeah, I read that one. Yeah, <laughs> he's like, he walks into a studio. He's like, their Mexican's not even working the grounds. They're not even the custodial. They're not even in, in the commissary. Like, even the jobs you would expect us to be in, we're yeah. not in. You know, and and he makes a great point. And, you know, you, you know, I'm very outspoken and people say, no, if Ken, you're outspoken, they're not going to, people aren't going to want to hire you. I go, they're not hiring us anyway. So we might as well speak our (laughs) truth. (laughs) Yeah. I go, my problem is I need more of you to come out and say things. Say it. (laughs) Yeah. That way, if we're all saying the same thing, I go, but you guys want me to be, you want me to get bloody through the wall. Right. 
you know, <laughs> and that's fine. I go because I'm in control of my own destiny, you know, in terms of the producers that I work with outside the Hollywood system, they don't care about all that. Right. The only thing they care about is if can can, can direect something that we can sell. Yeah. Yeah, how much money is it going to make forever for all exactly. of us? Exactly. Yeah. Essentially, that's what they care about. They're not yeah. worried about all the other stuff. They don't care if I went to Sundance. They don't care about right. who my agent is. They don't care. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you feel like for you, um, I mean, and you don't have to get super detailed about these other projects you have um, coming up, but are all of your stories just like in it or all about being Latino, being Chicano and all that? Or do you have a lot of other projects outside of, of that, if that makes sense. I know I'm yeah. probably not phrasing the question well, but. No, I would say that's that's a fair assessment mm -hmm. of my work. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very much about, uh, I didn't make it a conscious effort to brand myself that way, mm -hmm. but there are so many uh, Chicano stories out there. I, I can tell you about one project I hired about two years, same time, about two years ago, I wrote this script. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, Cannibal and the Headhunters. Are you familiar with Cannibal and Headhunters? Mm -hmm. Nobody is. I wasn't either. Uh, but this producer hired me to write this script. They're a Chicano rock band from the 1960s that opened mm -hmm. for the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl. Okay. Now, a lot of people have written this scripts about these people. They don't have the rights to it. Mm -hmm. My producer has the rights to tell the story. Mm -hmm. The guy that's a curator of the band today, they still perform. He has ownership over the name. So... We're telling the the story of the lead singer Frankie Cannibal Garcia. Okay, um, it's an incredible story, mm -hmm. but there's more to it than just the fact that they opened for the Beatles, and that's really the the other story about it. And I've I've interviewed a lot of people that were in his life that were intimately involved with him, and we have a really great story, a really great script. Um, and my producer, it's his first film, but he's in TV, um, and how we got together. It's very it was very you know, very, I guess you could say serendipitous, but a lot of de degrees of separation that connected us. So now it's just a matter of waiting for him to get the funding. We got a sizzle reel. We have a great script. We've done two uh, stage readings of it. Uh, I'm very excited about it. And it's the one I really want to make, mm -hmm. you know, but we, it's a period piece. It takes place in the 60s and the 80s. Yeah. So um, you're talking at a minimum 14 million, right? You know, um, I told them we really need 20 million to get this and a theatrical release to make the money back. Um, but the music is really part of what is can be the selling point. Mm -hmm. The top Latino films that have ever been made, Selena and La Bamba, they made the most money because music translates culture, economics, everything, right? More so than anything. Taylor Swift can travel all over the world. It doesn't matter that she doesn't speak the language. Yeah. People right. love her music, right? Same with, uh, I remember Katy Perry, my daughter's into Katy Perry. I was watching a documentary on her and she was in Brazil, I think. And mm -hmm. they were yelling something. She's like, I don't know what you're saying, but I love you. <laughs> yeah. It didn't matter. Uh, yeah. Music does not matter, right? It just crosses over everything. So that's a project mm -hmm. that I'm trying to get made as well. Um, but I have, a, I have a lot of experience now to know that things don't go Oh, great. I just got this finance. Let me go and shoot that film. And then right. I get back and I'm like, oh, Ken, hey, guess what? We got this finance. Now, they're all going to get finance at the same time. Right. I'm convinced. <laughs> and then you got to pick and then one I'm at that choose, point. I'm going to have to choose one. Yeah. And convince one other one to wait. To wait. <laughs> and the other two are going to go on and get other directors. Man, yeah, that's crazy. It, it feels, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm so far kind of removed from everything at this point. But what's interesting, too, is it seems like and maybe I'll cut this if I sound stupid, but <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm not always the most insightful and articulate. To no, be no, honest, you're doing that's <laughs> yeah. It, it almost feels like a double edged sword in a way where if you want to get something done and be Latino Chicano, it's like it's hard enough to to be that, but then it's almost like everything has to be about like kind of a social issue in a way. At this well, point, I would you know? say. A lot. There are a lot of people that use a social issue to promote themselves. Mm, mm -hmm. I don't do that. Yeah. I, t I focus on the story first. So, like to give you an example, I don't even write what I call Chicano. I mm -hmm. write characters. Yeah. But I know I'm going to cast Latinos in it. Yeah. I already know that. So I write human beings first, mm -hmm. and then I put them in. And I don't have a social issue per se. I right. want a story. Yeah. I tell a story, but. It's interesting that you say that because a lot of people use a social issue to a social issue to get you to watch their film. Yeah, it seems like that's the end. 
you know? Like, yeah, but is, you know what? Those fail. No one wants to be preached to at a movie. Yeah. You know, my, my latest film is about a homeless, schizophrenic homeless man. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the first thing a distributor told me is try to spin the homeless angle because that's an issue now. I'm like, right. no, man, this ain't a, this isn't a freaking PSA. It's a movie. Yeah. It's not a public service announcement. This is about a relationship between this homeless man and this lonely girl and their worlds. The, the homeless guy is constricted by his mind. Yeah. But he's open and free on the outside. Right. And the little girl is constricted in her environment and can't leave this backyard that her mom is trying to keep her safe in. Mm-hmm. But her creative mind is out. Right. That's where they contrast. That's how they connect. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you market that, brother? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can't, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, but that's the easy, uh, low hanging fruit. And I hate that. Yeah. I hate people. It's like, watch my movie because we're attacking right, racism. Right. Watch my movie because we're attacking homelessness. Watch my movie because we're attacking racism. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. What's your story? Yeah. No, yeah. That That's exactly it. I'm, I'm completely with you. That's like what, what is rough about it. It feels like it has to to be that in a way no, when like people you said, that do it's that, just they the, get attention, yeah. but it doesn't ever work. It doesn't yeah. go beyond what they're doing. Right. You know what I mean? And, and I think the audience rejects it and, and the really skilled directors can walk a line mm-hmm. on that. You know what I mean? Like I think I'm trying to think of a great, a, a really good movie where I felt like they did a really great job of, of walking that line. Latino movie. It came out last year. I'm trying to remember what it was called. I mean, a million miles away, I think, walk that line. I'm a little biased because, you know, I went to space camp in eighth grade. I wanted mm-hmm. to be a pilot. You know, mm-hmm. I wanted to um, not necessarily be an astronaut, but I wanted to be a fire pilot. And I love planes and everything. And so seeing a Chicano become an astronaut was right. huge. Right. Mm-hmm. And so for me, that story had more story than message. There was some message in yeah. there, but it had more story. And I think that filmmaker, she did a great job of writing that line. Yeah. And um, she earned, uh, I felt, the emotion. Mm-hmm. It wasn't pushed on me. Yeah. You know, um, there's a great, one of my favorite shots. I mean, still remember it is when he's launching up in the space shuttle and they cut to migrants all looking up. It's very mm-hmm. stylized. Yeah. But she's got the shot above them. They all stop what they're doing. They're looking up. They're nowhere near the launch. Yeah. That doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, that gave me goosebumps. Yeah. That moment. I mm-hmm. thought that was a bold thing for her to do. Mm-hmm. That could have been so syrupy and messagey. Yeah. For me, it wasn't. Maybe for other people it was. But for me, it wasn't. Like, yeah. I was sobbing when, when, yeah. when that moment happened. And I saw it in the theater. Plus, what's his name? Uh, Jose Hernandez was there. So I got to meet him, too. Mm-hmm. And I don't get starstruck, but I was because he's a freaking astronaut. Yeah. <laughs> I met a lot of filmmakers and actors. I've yeah. never met an astronaut, much less a Chicano astronaut. Right. And I told him, I said, I went to space camp. I still have my flight suit. I still have my wings. My wings are on my desk at home. Yeah. Like, I have them that remind me. Like, I was the only Latino in space camp yeah. in Huntsville, Alabama. Got called Chico for 10 days straight. Damn. All trying right. to learn and do my thing. And I was pilot on the mission of space shuttle. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, man, it was wild. I mean, talking about uh, Marigold the Matador that you brought up yeah, uh, in that conversation. So I think I heard that that one was a lot of improvisation, the, the way you what went about it. What I call it is in, it was unscripted. Unscripted. Um, I had a plan every single day. You mm-hmm. know, I had to I would do two weeks of prep for two days of shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was over a period of probably a year, year and a half. Mm. And yeah, because in the in the second half, so let's say if I started shooting over twelve months, you know, different weekends. I was completely broke at the time, mm-hmm. um, so I'd have to you know bartend and make enough money to to produce. And then there's a funny story about that, but um, and then I, I was like, okay, I got to start editing the footage. And my editor Elizabeth Cirillo is was amazing because you know I didn't use a slate for that. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but it gave her a tremendous amount of freedom. Right. Because I told her, this is my story, but maybe you see something, whatever you see, there's no guide. Mm-hmm. I go, so there's a freedom in the editing of yeah. this. And she says, 
okay. And she was so meticulous. I remember coming over to her. She had an avid system at her apartment and she's like, okay, this is what I got. And she puts up this giant board with all these post-its and she's like, this is, this happens here. And I go, yes, that's it. I go, but you got to move this over here. This mm-hmm. is where this is supposed to be. I go, where is all this footage of that I shot? She's like, well, I didn't know where to put it. I go, that's going to go here. Mm-hmm. So it's very collaborative with her. And that was before like an assembly and everything. That's literally just, she went through the footage, footage. and just and wrote is, down yes. before she even put it together. Absolutely. Oh, this wow, was okay. her going, everything you've sent me, this is what I see. Okay. And if you want to do this, this is missing. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'll get you that. I'll get you this because I knew the actors that I'd hired. Well, one of them was my daughter. One of them was my wife. Mm. And again, I hired them because they would be great in it. Mm -hmm. I didn't hire them just because they're my wife and my daughter. Right. And in fact, there was one set on one day. My daughter was 11 at the time and she didn't want to work that day. (laughs) She's not (laughs) a professional actress. You know, she's been in a lot of my stuff because she's really good. My my daughter is like me. Her mind doesn't turn off. Mm. So if you just look at her eyes, there's always there's always life going on. Mm -hmm. So when you put a camera on her, she doesn't do anything, right? But this one particular day, two weeks of prep, my crew's there. I don't feel good, and I go, I don't care. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. You promised me. I cannot reschedule this. This is going to cost me money. Mm-hmm. I don't feel good. My mother-in-law was involved, whom my daughter adores. No one can get her to work. <laughs> and I finally told her, because Camila Banus, who was in Counterpunch, mm-hmm. she was in this. I said, do you think Camila would do this to me? I go, Camila could be bleeding out her eyes, and she would show up to set. Okay, Papa. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally got her to set. She still talks about it to this day, about how... I said, look, the one thing with my, both my children, I said, I will never make a promise to you and not keep it. Mm-hmm. But if you ever promise me anything, you have to do the same. Right. And to my word, I've never made promises to them and not kept them. So, and that was the other thing that was the big thing. It was a huge weight when I said, look, you promised me this. That meant something to her. Mm-hmm. And she was like, okay. And then she tells the story like, oh, I was sick and you made your daughter perform. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm not your dad that day. Right. You know? Um, <laughs> But she was great in it. And um, I'm sorry, I got off track on terms of what you asked originally. Yeah. Oh, well, so two weeks of prep for like a shooting for two day, days, two shooting. days. Yeah. And so did that entail, um, I mean, you said unscripted, but I imagine, did you give them like an outline of like, here's kind of bullet points to hit? I would, yes, we shoot? I, would, I would tell the, the actor that day, okay. like, this is what I'm trying to capture. Okay. This is how it's going to fit in the story. Mm-hmm. And they would be like, and it was mostly visual, obviously. Yeah. So it's like, okay, okay, great. And, you know, and Ivan Basso, who plays the homeless guy, he's mm-hmm. been in, I think, four of my films. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant actor. Again, someone that Hollywood does know nothing about. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ivan's an act, the type of actor. I've written for a lot of actors that I work with. He's someone I never write for. Mm-hmm. I just write a character, and I know he'll pl- he can play it. Yeah. Um, so in that one, he was he was struggling with... with uh, some issues during that time. And I, and I didn't know what they were, but I knew he was struggling. Cause he mm-hmm. told me recently, he's like, man, I was going through it during that mm-hmm. time. I said, I know <laughs> that's right. why I was trying to get you on camera as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, of course I was I'm concerned about your, your health, but I think it helped you to be on camera and, and be doing the thing that you love. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so that was the process of that was, you know, and, you know, we had to get a permit because we shot at Grand Central Station and we mm-hmm. shot in the L.A. River. Yeah. Um, the Grand Central Station permit, though, was not a complete permit, but we were able to fake it because I had that. I had the permit for L.A. River. We shot in the L.A. River and then we shoot in Grand Central Station and I went through there. They have a whole thing about a, a behavior appropriate, what you can shoot, taking mm-hmm. pictures and stuff. And they said, as long as you don't use a tripod, you can shoot take pictures okay and we shot on a dslr okay so (laughs) yeah so my guy is doing oh and that's another whole nother story but my dp on this project was my dp on cholo chaplain and when we were doing cholo chaplain it was during the time of i I don't know if you remember when it was during the bush administration we had these terror alerts yeah the terror alert would go to orange or yellow Mm -hmm. and we were shooting in downtown wilmington uh once Cholo Chaplain and the Vincent Thomas Bridge is in the background. Mm-hmm. Well, two weeks later, the FBI are at my door. Oh, wow. Someone said me and him were engaging in suspicious terrorist activity filming the bridge. 
Oh, first of all, no one's going to blow up that bridge. (laughs) That's number one. (laughs) It's not worth it. Um, Second of all, it was in broad daylight, and it was so obvious we were shooting something. Yeah. So that same DP is with me now doing (laughs) Marigold the Matador. We're in there, and Homeland Security walks up to us and flashes his badge. And he's like, hey, how are you guys doing today? And I'm like, hi. I go, look, we have permission to meet. He's like, let me talk to you for a second. He's like, I'm, I'm Homeland Security. And I look at my 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 DP, Scotty, and I'm like, God, I'm going to get us in trouble again. I go, what do you need, man? We have a permit to be here. He's like, uh, you do? And I said, yes. And I took out the permit from mm-hmm. the LA River and showed it to him. And there was the, the name of the guy on there. And he knew who that guy was. Okay. And he's like, oh, okay. I'm just... Mm-hmm. Just checking, just letting sure you guys are legit. And we're DSL, DSLR, so, um, but with prime lenses. That's why it looks so good. So we shot throughout all of Grand Central Station, you know, and um, didn't have a problem. There. So it's, it's knowing the loopholes. You got to find, yeah. you know, that movie we made for very little money. Um, and, you know, I'm really proud of it. It's an emotional film and um, people are starting to discover it on Tubi. And that's all I want, really. I mean, I'm, I've made some money back on it. But it's it's out there now. It's the yeah. only film that didn't have distribution, and now I got it on platforms where people can see it. Uh, but yeah, that was. I mean, a funny story on that was a guy that had shot a promo for it. Uh, he was a Wilmington filmmaker. That's why I kind of reached out to him. He's like, he was doing a document. He never finished it, but he was doing mm-hmm. a documentary on me, and he, I was doing my kids' laundry. This is in the middle of shooting Marigold. Okay. I'm doing my kids' laundry. And I get this ping and it's like negative $600 in your account because my rent check had just gone through. And I'm like at a low point and then I'm cleaning. I'm doing, you know, I was, I'm a stay at home dad and I'm like cleaning up. I'm going through my kid's laundry and I pull $20 out of my daughter's pants pocket that mm. made one of her grandparents must have given her $20. <laughs> and I went and put it on her dresser. I'm like, my my 11 year old has more money than me right now. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, what am I doing? I have no business making this movie. Mm-hmm. So that's the craziness, the passion, the, yeah. you know, and again, my wife, I give a lot of credit to because yeah, she should have left me a long time ago, <laughs> but it got done. And, and again, I didn't rush it. I mean, I, I completed that film seven years ago. And I just released it last year. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because I noticed when I was looking in IMDb and when I watched it, like the dates didn't align. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Yeah. I guess it was held on to for a while. A long and- time. And uh, because I just, I had movies out there. I didn't mm-hmm. need to just get it out there. Yeah. I wanted to put it somewhere where people would see it. And, you know, and then the Highland Park Film Festival, uh, I applied there. I, like I said, I don't apply. And I, I love that film festival. Mm. Um and they got, they get, they, we won the jury award there, which was great. Um, the jury award to me is worth something because these are professionals that are watching the films. Yeah. Um, so it was a great, it was a great year last year for that. Um, and now this year we'll see. It's a slow start, but I'm hoping if something gets financed before my birthday um, in June, I'll feel really good. Why the uh, choice for that movie to do the uh, unscripted style? It's like, a very, it's a very simple, uh, stupid, uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to write another script. <laughs> <laughs> I was at a point where I had written like three scripts that were not going to get made without millions of dollar budget, right? Yeah. Million, million, you know, a, a six, a six to seven feature, a six to seven figure budget. Mm. So I'm like, let me do something where I don't have to write a script, but, and, and it was inspired by bartending. I was bartending mm. and. Um, late at night, and I remember a woman walked by and she had two, her two young kids. So this is 1230 at night. I had this yeah. giant window that she's coming from the fashion district mm-hmm. because she was working in a factory there mm-hmm. and was getting the bus with her two small children. So it kind of inspired that. And then there was this homeless guy that was, and he's still around. I think I've seen mm-hmm. him a couple of times downtown riding a bike and he had on this Viking helmet. Okay. Yeah. And I was just kind of like. And the very first thing I ever wrote, bro, it was years ago. And I just, before I was a writer, director, anything, I just knew I wanted to tell the story of Cristina Sanchez. She's the first female bullfighter in Mm. Spain. Very successful. I'm like, God, her story would make a great movie. Before I knew anything. And I just wrote this thing. I wrote the trailer for it. Before I knew what I was doing. And I was like, well, 
especially bullfighting now, right? It's not going to be a taboo. It's going to be a taboo thing to right, make. Right, right. And then I saw Blanca Nieves. You ever see Blanca Nieves? Mm-mm. It's a retelling of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, but Snow White's a bullfighter. Okay. Yeah. Huh. It's a Spanish film. Yeah. And it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Black and white. Okay. And I saw that, and that inspired me. I'm like, I can make my Christina Sanchez movie, but I'm going to make the little girl a bullfighter. And it's all going to be in her mind. That's how she mm. is. She gets her courage. Yeah. And so then the Viking hat became a bull. Mm. And she sees it over the fence. And, you know, and, uh, and again, that's how the story came together. I yeah. had a story. So I was going to do that. And I got the producer, Nina Rausch, who was an actress that I'd worked with and had hired me to direct a couple of things. And she was an actress getting into producing. And I had, she was in a, she, I had hired her as my, assistants for, my assistant for um, a film I did called uh, La Guapa. And I, she did so well on that, I made her an associate producer. And then when I decided to do this, I said, look, this is what I want to do. And she was like, okay. So she helped me out with that. And um, she got a first producing credit, you know. Mm. But there was a lot of women involved in that particular production. Um, my assistant director was a woman. My producer was a woman. My executive producer was a woman. My editor was a woman. Um, the leads were women. It was just me and Scotty, my DP, who were only men on that set. Um, and that was by design. You know, I was telling a woman's story. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, we got a restaurant, the Condor in East Hollywood mm-hmm. donated their restaurant to us. Again, it was through my bartending. Yeah. I nice. made a lot of connections through bartending. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of times people are focused on, oh, who's that over there? Right. As opposed to looking at what's right in front of them. Yeah. And I'm the guy that looks right in front of them. Mm-hmm. What's right in front of me? What can I use? You know? Yeah. I would love to work with that guy over there. He doesn't know who I am or, mm-hmm. you know, that's going to be too... Why don't I look at the talent that I have right in front of me? So I think that's part of successful independent producing when you're doing your own projects. Yeah. You know, everything you have is right there, especially in this town, you know. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's a, a million stories that come out of that one. I mean, the whole cop scene, I did not have a permit for that. Okay. And, and you were, that was you, right? Yeah. You were, that yeah. Was okay. <laughs> I was one of the cops because I'm like, <laughs> yeah. if anyone's going to get a shot on this set, it's got to be me. <laughs> um, and again, I tell actors, don't do that. Yeah. But that particular, so just so your, your, your audience has some context, we, I had Mario who runs Cop Shop LA. He's done a lot of, uh, he was, he helped me with Counterpunch. His son was actually the little Emilio in mm-hmm. Counterpunch. Mm-hmm. And then when I did, Guapa, I didn't use his company because I, I don't, I don't like asking friends for discounts. Mm. And so I used his competitor because it was cheaper and he got, he didn't get upset, but he was like, Ken, why didn't you call me? I'm like, cause I don't want to ask a discount from you. Right. He's like, I will give it to you. He's like, I'd rather you use me than use my competitor. Mm. And I said, okay, I have something then. <laughs> and he's like, what do you need? I go, I need two LAPD uniforms uh-huh. with guns, badges, everything. And I need a cop car for my next project. I go, what can you do for me? He's like, I go, oh, and I don't have a permit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I love him to death because he's like, this is what we're going to do. And we shot in my mother-in-law's neighborhood. My mother-in-law knows everybody. So okay. I told her, I go, tell everybody we're shooting a movie. Mm-hmm. There's going to be some violence. There's going to be a cop car out there. There's going to be an altercation with a homeless person who's not homeless. Yeah. Let everybody know what we're doing. And she says, okay, mijo, no problem. So my mother-in-law was like my location manager. So she let everybody know that. We had a plan. That alley is right near my mother-in-law's house. There's a back gate right there. Mm -hmm. I said, and Brody was my colorist. He was the other cop. Okay. He's like, Ken, can you put me in? He, and this is the problem when you ask a director something like, hey, man, just give me a cameo or something. Right. I love your stuff. I'm like, all right, Brody, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> and he goes, well, I, go, I don't have a permit. You're going to be in full LAPD dress yeah. as I am. We're going to have plastic guns <laughs> that look really real. Yeah. We're going to drive around the block in a cop car. I go, and we could get arrested. And I go, but I'm going to have everything as secure as I want. He's like, no, no, I'm, I'm down. I'm down. I'm doing it. I go, we're going to probably do this one or two takes. Yeah. It was an overcast day, which was perfect. Right. So there were no shadows. Mm-hmm. It was like, it was all meant to be, right? <laughs> so we get there and Mario's like, okay, so Ken, this is what we're going to, and Mario knows a lot of these cops. He knows a lot of the LAPD. So Mario, who's the guy, cop shop LA, he goes, so this is what we're going to do. If a cop shows up, 
you and Brody will go back into the backyard, mm. take off the guns, take off that, and take off your shirts, just have your T-shirts on. Yeah. And then let me talk to them and then come out. He's like, you may still get arrested, but you won't get shot. Right. And I said, okay. So he's telling me and Brody this. So we had a whole plan. It's an intense scene, as you see. Yeah. It's the climax of the film. Right. And I would have liked one more take, but I felt like we got it. I'm like, I'm not going to push our luck. Right. And... Yeah, we shot the scene. And I tell that story, but I tell people I had as much of a controlled environment on set, on location, that you could possibly have. Right. But if you don't have that, you know, the only other time I did that was I produced a Vietnam drama in Studio City at a 99-seat theater. It was a just beautiful play called Tracers, and I had wooden M16s. Mm-hmm. And there was a scene where we all had to go out the theater at the front of the theater, then run around to the back. And we're doing that carrying wooden M16s. And we had to do that every night of the production. No one called the cops. We're in Studio City. Yeah. <laughs> they just assumed, I think, we were just right. <laughs> a play. But in East L.A., it's a different thing. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, and again, I tell people, I go, unless you, and because you've heard there was a story, uh, not not too recently, but maybe five years ago, where someone got shot shooting a short film. They had a gun and, and the oh, I didn't that. hear about that. Wow. Yeah, or they okay. got, I don't think they got arrested or something. And so, and my, I have a book coming out, and I, in the book, I talk about that. I said, look, I do not suggest it at all. I have, was in a very controlled right. environment, and um, it was the only reason I did that, and I needed to finish my film. Um, at that time, I probably could have postponed it, saved some more money and done it, but I was really anxious to get it done at that time. Um, and that's the thing, man, there's no time. There's no time limit on anything. The technology is changing so fast too. It's just, yeah. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> yeah, I would, I wouldn't dare. <laughs> <laughs> I don't suggest it again. And also I'm like coming with six films behind me. Yeah. You know, it's your first time out doing something like that. Right. Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. No, I, um, I was curious about the unscripted nature of it because, so I did do a feature for myself like in 20, maybe 2014, 2015, but this is like freaking kind, kind of like you mentioned with your first one. Like for me, it's just an hard drive. Hell, I call right. it like it's in purgatory, like on the shelf. Um, but I recently, you know, like watch and I sent the link to my two out and it was a similar situation where I, I got really inspired by like that mumble core kind of era, like Joe Swamberg and, uh, you know, um, Greta Gearwig did a lot right. of that stuff, like in the, uh, the Duplass brothers. Yeah. So I was like, and cause I'm just really bad at writing. And the, the fact is I'm also like, I'll admit it. I'm, I just, have not mustered the discipline to make myself good at it. Right. You that's know, the if one we're thing I'm the most disciplined at. Yeah. So that's writing. great. I, yeah. I, I, I wish it, I could make it. Yeah. At it. <laughs> See, that's good. <laughs> and it, that is, uh, that, that'll make the difference. Right. For sure. But, um, so I did a similar, um, kind of project where I, yeah, each scene I had it like for me, it was a bullet point. that's why I asked. It was like an outline of, yeah. Like I gave them, here's what your character is. This is what they're all about. Your character is all about this. So you have like, a history Mm -hmm. and each scene, this is like where it's going to begin and where it needs to end and checkpoints along the way. And it was just all handheld wireless labs, like gorilla style around downtown LA long takes like car mount for like 20 minutes. So it's, it's a very talky movie, but have you finished it? I I did finish it and I have, and I was, I was watching it recently and I finally sent the link to um, my two actors and a friend of mine. And when I was watching it, I was like, holy shit, dude, like we did this. Like, why do I have so many excuses? now? <laughs> like I just went and and it, it was kind of what we were talking about earlier, where it's almost like the more experience I gain, the, the more precious I am. Whereas here and it's funny because I shot You're it free. on the. Yeah. And I shot it on like the first generation black magic camera, mm-hmm. you know, like ISO 800 24 millimeter lens on most of it. F2 point out now. You know, I've got right. 4K and we got 6K and, and ISO 3200. Yeah, and all this stuff. And I still feel like I can't even emulate what I did back then. You know, it's so funny. Just like, oh, we're going to stand under the street light or we're going to drive around this particular part of downtown LA where there's a lot of neon or, or LA Live where there's right. plenty. And if they go into a little of darkness for a few seconds, whatever. 
And I was really shocked. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'd man. love to see like, it, man. I'll, yeah, I'll send, send you the link. I, I don't know if you'll it. like it, but I'll send it to you. Send it to me anyway. Yeah. But I think, I, I think, well, here's the thing you have now experience. Your taste has gotten better yeah. probably since then. Mm-hmm. But also I bet you it's not as bad as you thought it was. A little bit. Yeah. 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 And so I always look, I mean, look, those of us that are more, the most scrutin, uh, that scrutinize our own work, mm-hmm. like we don't even realize how much better it is than most of the shit that's out there. Right. Right. And that's what I say. Just like I said, don't be precious with anything. Put it out there. And I go, because they're the people, the people that are the loudest and the ones that are on social media promoting their stuff the most are usually the worst. They right. don't know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. They don't even know that they're bad. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it doesn't mean they get any traction. They just get eyes, right? Mm-hmm. They get eyes and then people move on. I mean, it's just, but um, yeah, the most free you're going to be is on that first project. Yeah, for sure. You know, and the experience is good. But when you, you never, you always feel like you're reaching, you're something, you're always reaching like it's just beyond. Yeah, right. And, and in my writing, it's the same thing. It's like, like I couldn't write for television. I don't have that kind of, you know, there's a friend of mine that is a writer on television. And I told him, I, he's like, what do you want to do with your writing? I go, I want to, I want to, I, I could see me being a showrunner, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. not necessarily a staff writer. Right. Like I want to tell my stories. Yeah. I want to tell somebody else's story. Mm-hmm. And, he does both, you know, but like, you know, he's looking at me going like, how do I get my films produced as a, my scripts produced as a feature film? Yeah. And I'm going, how do I get to direct television? You know, and we're like, right. but our, you know, if he ever got to be an executive producer, which he probably will eventually, because he's really successful and, and really good at what he does, um, that he will get that opportunity. And then hopefully I'll get an opportunity to direct something. But he has a script that he's working on now that I really, two scripts that I really want to direct. Mm-hmm. Um, but also he's a writer. He doesn't want to be a director, right. you know, and I'm a director. I don't necessarily want to be a writer. I write the stories that I want to tell. But like yeah. this this one this morning, like I didn't write it, but I, it's it's in my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. It's in my, and I already know how I want to cast it. I know how I want to shoot it. I know where I want to shoot it. Yeah, I just going back to experience, it's not necessarily, uh, it, it's, it is a good thing, but the naivety is also a good thing yeah. as well. Like I, that's my thing is now trying to get back to that naivety mm-hmm. of just focusing on not having expectations and just focusing on the love of what I'm doing, yeah. creating. And that's it. So like, and, and I've gotten back in the theater. Like I hadn't directed a play in over 20 years. Last year I directed a one act um, for the Brisk Festival in Santa Monica and we won best play. Nice. Um, and I forgot how much I really enjoyed theater Mm -hmm. and directing theater so if that's what i can direct right now or teach and work with directors to communicate with actors i'll do that until i get my next gig so it's finding those things like your podcast you know we're doing a documentary Mm -hmm. you know it's it's you know i I shot again it was probably off of marigold where i was really broke at a cracked iphone 6 and i shot two mini docs and two more episodes of trolla chaplin nice you know and they came out great i was really happy with them and i'm like do what you can with what you have. I find the people that go to film school when they get out, they're the hardest ones to start because you're not going to have a 30 person crew right. and millions of dollars of equipment to do the next thing you do out of film school. Yeah. Right. You know, and that's a hard place for them to start. They want to, they want a career trajectory that goes like this. Mm-hmm. And I've had to stop and start many times, you know, and take a breather or sometimes it was just like I lost my house you mm-hmm. know it was like holy shit and then I like had given up filmmaking at that point when I lost my house it just I had sacrificed so much to something that I loved and you know I had to move my kids and my wife out of our, our home because I had taken a risk I took a huge jump and missed the cliff other side of the cliff so I just put everything aside I said and I'm not doing and I had written two scripts already that were supposed to get funded they didn't get funded and that's what mm-hmm. happened that's how I lost my house and or at least that house so I had taken all my scripts all my posters everything I just threw it in storage I said I'm done right I'm not doing this anymore and then what happens three months later producer calls hey got the funding <laughs> and I'm like fuck you <laughs> <laughs> What? What's wrong? What happened? I'm like, I'm done. Like, yeah. what do you mean you're done? I'm like, I lost my house three months ago, man. Like, why didn't you tell us? It's like, oh, because you guys didn't have any money anyway. Right. You know? I'm like, this is after the uh, the financial crash of 2008. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, we lost, I lost my house in 2000, the end of 2010. So it wasn't that it was blockbuster going out of business. Mm -hmm. They were way too late on everything. You know, and a couple of my films got into Blockbuster and they really liked my stuff. They were going to get into production mm -hmm. and had shown up to my, in Mexico, my third feature film, which was the last film in the Drive-By Chronicles. And I don't like doing this stuff, but, you know, they rolled out the red carpet for these executives to come to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it's a distraction. I don't, right. I don't, I, that's their job. You can kiss their ass. Mm -hmm. I'm here to make my movie. But, you know, took them ATV writing and took them to all the bars and, you know, did that whole thing. And then finished the film, went to Mexico City to edit it. And he says, they want to finance your next three films. I'm freaking great. I get on the plane. I land. I'm on my way home. My producer calls me. And that time, he had found out they were going out of business. Don't tell anyone. Blockbuster's going out of business, though. I'm like, what does that mean for the next three films? He's like, that's not going to happen, but we're going to try to produce hearts mm -hmm. anyway. But the budget's going to be significantly smaller. And I'm like, this is not what I needed to hear right now. But that's what happened. And, um, and then he comes back three, four months later. And I did back-to-back -back features. I did Hearts of Men, which is my fourth, and Counterpunch was my fifth. Okay. That was four months after losing my house. I had back-to-back -back features. That's crazy, dude. You're, you're <laughs> honestly, I mean, like, you're drive. You still want to be a filmmaker. Uh, yeah, you know, you're... <laughs> Your drive and everything to, to keep going is incredibly inspiring. And it's like, I feel like that you lived like such the real story that I imagine so many people probably go through that you don't hear about. It's like, you know, you talk about the coming out of film school and everyone wants their career to do this. It's like, and I think, I mean, I, I've fallen into this trap. I think a lot of us have when we were younger of like, you know, oh, the the Kevin Smiths and the Quentin Tarantinos yeah. and Robert Rodriguez's of the world. Yeah. Uh, Richard, like, but they're the oh, exceptions. You, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh, you made the movie and then it was happened to be good. And here we go. Yeah. You know, now you're riding the that. limo. <laughs> yeah. It's like, um, and it's like, yeah, I mean, I just named what three people in the, like in all, all the people doing this. Oh, but yeah. Yeah. We all, I think early on when we're young, like feel that, oh, yeah, that's going to be it. But oh, man, absolutely. that that reality, I mean. I've, I've had nothing, you know, I've had no hardships comparable to, to you, but, um, I mean, uh, sacrifices too. like, oh, there's yeah. so much I haven't done in my life that I, I, I try not to look back and like, Oh, I wish I did this. Right. I try not to do no, that. No, Cause definitely it not. is what it is. Absolutely. You know, um, it's like, what can I do now with the information I have? But yeah, just sacrifices and things I didn't do be in pursuit of, you know, this, this filmmaking thing. Um, and then there's also the matter of like, man, there's so many little periods of time that were maybe not wasted, but I was doing other things. Like you said, there's like a start and a stop. And then right. for me, I kind of fell off for a couple of years and I'm trying to get back in and this and that. If and, it's still tugging yeah. at you, that's all you need. You just got to do it. That's yeah. It. I got to try and yeah. Hey, like, if it's tugging at you and you can't stop thinking about it, you know, I always say if it's the last thing, you know, cause I get people, even family members like, oh, you know, she wants to be, my daughter wants to be an actress. What's mm -hmm. advice to you? And I said, if it's not the first thing you think about when you wake up right. and the last thing you think about before you go to bed, don't save yourself the pain. Mm -hmm. I'm all, mm -hmm. because especially young people, and, and, and I just tell them reality. I don't try to discourage anybody because to me, even if someone had told me all, and, and the thing is, I did a lot of homework. Like I knew the struggles going into yeah. film, filmmaking. You know, and I, I was getting in not knowing anything. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to go back to film school. Right. You know, I had just was stupid enough to, you know, spend $3,500 on a camera that I didn't know how to make. Uh -huh. You know, but there was a guy that I was, again, bartending, and he graduated from film school. And he was like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm going to make a movie. He's like, oh, I wish I could have made a movie. I go, well, what did you go to school for? Oh, I was a DP. Oh, okay, well, come yeah. DP my film. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was that I was producing not knowing that's what I was doing. Right. You know, but I always, t you know, the young people today don't understand, especially if they're starting in their 20s and, you know, mid 20s. I'm like, what you need to understand as an actress, if you want to pursue this now, you're auditioning against people that started when they were three months old and did right. their first commercial. Those aren't the people that you're going to beat out. You're going to beat out the people that are starting at the same time as you are. Mm -hmm. And when you're in your 30s, that's when you're going to start booking stuff. I go, you're not going to be booking the young stuff now yeah. because those kids, they already have 20 years on you, mm -hmm. you know? So 
that's what I try to tell people. It's hard. I don't like to give advice because it comes off discouraging, but I can't give someone advice on where they're at. I can only give them advice on where I'm, I'm at. Right. So when someone's at the same level of me, well, Ken, what would you do on this? It's, a, it's not as discouraging. I would say, well, mm-hmm. do this. So there's a, and actually two filmmaker friends of mine that would ask me for advice. They were the ones that encouraged me to write a book. Mm. They're all, you have all this experience, all these great stories, you should write a book. And they both said that to me in the same, in the same week. So I said, all right, I'll start writing. I've been writing this book for five years and I'm on the final draft. I had it already mm. edited, an editor already edited one. I'm on the final draft of it. But I also said, if I'm able to write a book, an entire book about my experiences as an independent filmmaker raising his family, um, before my next film gets financed, like I had this thing of, if I can write a book about it and not have my next film done, because to me, writing a book is so much more difficult. <laughs> yeah. That might be the day I, I have to stop, mm. you know? So there's a subconscious part of me that doesn't want to finish it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a cover. I have everything. Everything is ready to go. I just need two weeks to sit down and do the final draft on it. Mm. But I'm in a different place now where I'm, I'm like, I got so many things. I um, what do they call it in the iron spikes in the iron or um, you know what I'm talking? Oh, God, I, I think so. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but something will come back. I'm confident something that will will start and get and get going. Um, particularly with TV being where it is right now, and the studios being where they are. There are a lot of independent uh, producers and filmmakers, or fi- producers and financiers that want to get into this business and they need an experienced director. So, so yeah, man, that's, that's, uh, that's where I'm at. Yeah. I mean, I could talk to you all day, but <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. And, we, and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Sorry. I'm like, man, I just want to keep going. No, but. no. Yeah. It's, it's all, it's, it's, uh, no, it's all great. I mean, we have freaking mescal yeah. and rye and, and everything else, but yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's a thing where there's no secret. Mm-hmm. There's no secret. You just got to, and there are a lot of hurdles and Mm. obstacles. And if you can do it and not get discouraged, you know, um, you'll eventually get to that place that you want to be. Now, when that happens, there's no way of predicting that, you know. But I have to say, though, with my my secret ingredient has always been my, my wife. And her attitude has always been, you can't quit now because we've sacrificed so much and you've done so much. Why would you quit now? You quit when you're just starting out mm-hmm. and you haven't invested that much. Yeah. But when you've invested as much as, you, as I have in my career and as much as my wife has invested in my career, um, and I'm not talking money, I'm talking time yeah. and heartache and struggle. Um, yeah, you can't. There's just too much at stake. You know, and my kids are older now. I'm still a young guy. My kids are out of high school. And um, if I just started now, let's say I'm just starting from scratch now, right. I'm in a great place. Mm-hmm. I don't have the responsibility I had in my 30s when I started, where I was, you know, yeah. just down for a nap. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Get See, home that, that, at one o'clock in the morning from the bar yeah. on the computer. See, that's a whole other aspect of it that we haven't even really gotten into. No. Like family and kid like that. Man. Well, I'll say this. Crazy. I get I get filmmakers that reach out to me and want advice, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there, how do I how can I do what you do, Ken? And I'm like, all right, let me ask you a couple of questions. They're like, yeah. And I have my my cell phone on the thing. I go, Do you have a wife? Mm-hmm. Like, no, no, I'm not married. And you have a girlfriend? No. I'm like, okay. Do you have any kids? No, I don't have any kids. I'm like, do you have a job? No, don't have a job. I'm like, you have one of these? Yeah. yeah. I'm like, why are you asking me <laughs> right. how to do it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I give them that perspective. Yeah. You know, I go, you want me to, you want to ask me how to make a million dollars? I don't know how to do that. Mm-hmm. You want me to ask you how to make it easy for you? I don't know how to do that. Right. There's nothing easy about doing it. I'm like, is it the, and I ask, is it the last thing you think about when you go to bed and the first thing you think about when you wake up? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then do it. It ain't going to be perfect, man. Yeah. You know, it ain't going to, because you're not Robert Rodriguez. You're not Tarantino. You're not Kevin Smith. Yeah. You're not the Duplass brothers. Mm-hmm. You know, the Duplass brothers inspire me in a different way because I don't like any of their work, you know, but their message, I love their message. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know how they have an audience for the work they have. I'm not saying it's bad. It just doesn't 
it doesn't speak to me. Their yeah. work does not speak to me. I do like the puffy chair. I do like that one a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I'm inspired by the puffy chair yeah. the same way I'm like, how do they have a career on this? <laughs> <laughs> well, their their short film about the that that like won awards at Sundance yes. that they did on the tape. Right. Oh, that's the, right. Yeah, yeah, the the messaging machine. That's one where I'm like, man, you guys really got lo- like very similar to you. I love the message. I love their vibe and that. You yeah, know, that, yeah. I love the spirit, the attitude. But yeah, same. With that one, I'm like, damn, that's what did it, huh? Oh, yeah. One and, in a million. One and they're million. still indie. Yeah. They they they're they're pretty mainstream. They've been in they've been in some big stuff as actors. They've been yeah. in some pretty big stuff. Yeah. Um so I love that they they still maintain their indie yeah. indie attitude. Same with Robert Rodriguez, same with um uh yeah, I think Kevin Smith too kind of has that. They, same yeah, spirit, yeah, they're still yeah. there, like almost to a point where I'm just kind of like, why aren't you guys, you know, you know, they're, they're, they're happy where they're at doing mm-hmm. those things. Like, I don't know that I have necessarily have a, I have a desire to do like, you know, like a predator, like prey. Like right. I have a desire to do a film like that. You know, I don't necessarily have a desire to do a Marvel film or yeah. just a star Wars film, but, um, I would love to do like, you know, something like a predator, something like from the eighties mm-hmm. action films that I grew up watching, yeah. like a RoboCop. Yeah. You know, they messed up that, that <laughs> remake. I was so excited for it. And I was just like, Man, you guys missed the point. You guys really missed the point. <laughs> like when you think of the original RoboCop and how violent that was, and I don't know how old you are, but I, like I said, I grew up in the '80s, and there's this this picture that goes around that I see from time to time, and I, I keep forgetting to to download it and, and share it. But it was a marquee mm-hmm. at a movie theater, and on it was Full Metal Jacket, RoboCop, Predator. Like, <laughs> I was just like, Amazing. that was my Amazing. summer. Yeah. And seeing those <laughs> films over and over yeah. for an entire summer. That's awesome. All of them rated R. Yeah. All of them, no PG-13. <laughs> yeah. All of them rated R. All of us 10, 11 years old yeah. <laughs> in this theater watching it. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> that was one of my great full circle moments. I'll share this with you real quick. Yeah. Alpidia Carillo. You know who Alpidia Carillo is? Uh-huh. You don't know who Alpidia Carrillo is? I don't. Sorry. I know. Oh, man. <laughs> you just did Predator. And you don't know who Alpidia Carrillo is. She's Maria in Predator. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I forgot. The, yeah. She was just in Blue Beetle. Yes. Right? She was the mother. She's the mother in yeah. Blue Beetle. And I guarantee you she got cast of that because that filmmaker loved Predator. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she's been an, she's a friend of mine. Okay. And she reached out to me and wanted to show Counterpunch. And she has a film festival in Mexico that they do out in the, like, the boonies where they have an air, you know. And she did Counterpunch, Marigold, and Banador, uh, an incredible support of my film. But it's like, when he, like you said, like these first full circle moments mm-hmm. where you have people in your phone, phone numbers in your phone you never thought you would. Right, yeah. And <laughs> I always use her as an example because the, the new trend of Latina actresses or Latino actresses is... And I almost feel like they have the same publicist. They all say the same thing. Well, I didn't grow up seeing me on the screen. And I'm like, really? I'm like, Rita Moreno, you didn't see her on the screen? Alpidia Carillo was in right. one of the biggest films of 1987. You had uh, Maria Conchita Alonso, who was mm. in freaking Running Man yeah. opposite, uh, you know, she was in Predator 2. She, yeah. I mean, she was like the actress, Colors. Mm-hmm. She worked with a-list talent across her entire Don't career. forget uh, Vasquez from Aliens. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I'm, just, well, no, wait, I'm kidding. I'm no, kidding. no, but... but <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, up, a lot of us thought she was yeah. Chicana, yeah. man. Every, like, everybody thought... It's a great yeah. freaking performance. <laughs> and then, like, and I got this... Uh, I loved uh, Gustavo Reliano. You know, are you familiar with him? A writer at the LA Times? No, no. He used to write for the OC mm-hmm. a Registry, I think it was called. He has a book called Ask a Me- Mexican based off a column he had. Mm-hmm. He did a screening of Aliens and he had Jeanette Goldstein come oh, to really? that screening. Yeah, because he recognized the authenticity of mm-hmm. her performance. Now, the younger generation today is going to say, this is a great t- topic. Like, this would be a great topic for another, maybe another show. But yeah. I defend her performance in that because mm-hmm. she was badass. And yeah. even when she was being questioned she's irish mm. she was being qu- she was in terminator 2 and titanic as yeah well. yeah and um and she plays an irish woman in titanic and nobody knows it's vasquez um <laughs> but she was being interviewed by gustavo and she's talking about how she came up with the the saying on her thing and the accent and everything else and she's like yeah because i was playing a latina and she said it with an accent and i was like <laughs> she's badass yeah I would, I would defend her playing that part any day of the week. Like <laughs> I just thought she was great. And 
even my mom, because Cholas from San Fernando Valley was like, <laughs> man, who was that actress? She was like, oh, Jeanette Goldstein. That doesn't sound right. right. Like, my mom's like, oh, that might her be her married name. I'm like, yeah, that, you're probably right. This is when 1987. Right, right. And, you know. I, feel, I feel like it was fairly recently, too, that it almost felt like suddenly in the zeitgeist a few years ago, everyone realized yes. that, like, wait, that's John Connor's uh, foster mom? Yes. <laughs> like, oh, shit. <laughs> No, it was recently yeah, because right. her perform. I mean, it's not the same. You can't say you just buy it. Man. Yeah, yeah, you buy you it. You can't say that's the same as Charlton Heston in Touch of Evil. Right. Okay. You want to <laughs> yeah. make that argument? Let's. They're two different things. Yeah. Eli Wallach playing every mm-hmm. ban- bandito in every spaghetti western there is. Yeah. And I love Eli Wallach, but like, you know, mm-hmm. come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Dang. <laughs> Tell me you couldn't find it. Like a, there, oh, there were so many great Mexican actors at that time that could have played that, you know. But uh, <laughs> have you ever seen Once Upon a Time in the West? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes. I, I think it's funny. There's this great interview where uh, Henry Fonda talks about, you know, how uh, Leone wanted him to be the bad guy and yeah. all that and how he like. He's all right. So I got the mustache and the brown contacts. <laughs> like, and I, I love him in that movie. Yeah. I love that. But I just thought that was so funny. It's like, oh, that's like the image of the bad guy. Well, huh? yeah. That's what it's got to be. Well, it's all surface. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. It's not that, especially, it's not, that's the time of the yeah. type of acting of that. Right. Yeah. I, I do love that Leone was like, no, hell no. Right. Like, I want everyone to know that Henry Fonda is about to murder this little boy right now. And right. it's got to be you. In your baby blues, like that's that's and what that's what made that guy a, such yeah. a great director, though. Yeah, too, yeah. knowing that, mm-hmm. you know, I remember uh, Magnificent Seven is one of my favorite films, you know, and when I became a filmmaker and I started, you know, the the big thing was Blu-rays and the commentaries, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, and it was heartbreaking because now I can't watch that film the same. And you know, uh, uh, John Mag- Sturgis, who directed uh, Magnificent Seven, okay. And he was talking about Eli Wallach in that, in the part of, uh, God, now I can't even think. It's been a long time since I've seen the film. And I used to watch it all the time, and I can't watch it now. But he was saying it, it used to drive him crazy. He would look to put the gun back in the holster. Right. And he says, this guy's gun is like another yeah, arm right. to him. He wouldn't have to look. But it was like, he would always look. So I noticed that every time, <laughs> was that he would look down yeah. and put the gun back. You know, and he had the accent. And he was, you know, and doing the whole thing. And... Um, and then he was talking about there's a shot where he has the camera stationary and they're crossing a creek. All of the magnificent. He had, these are huge egos he's dealing with, right, right? right? And every time they would pass the camera, some of someone would do something, mm-hmm. right? Like pick at their spur or do something in camera. It looks terrible, yeah. right? But you can see it now. <laughs> right. And I didn't notice it at first. I'm like, they're all performing. They're all trying to like, yeah. you know, and that Steve McQueen and Yul Brenner always would... Uh, try to one up each other for that camera time. Yeah. And Yul Brenner took him aside, Steve McQueen aside and said, listen, all I have to do is take off my hat, <laughs> you know, cause he's, you know, bald. Right. He's like, you want to play this game with me? He's like, all I have to do is take off my hat. <laughs> yeah. And I'll never forget. That was the one thing that kept me off cigarettes, uh, was in the early, late, early eighties. My mom smoked, uh, when I was growing up, she had quit, but, uh, she used to smoke and, they had a commercial with Yul Brenner, where okay. he is deep into his lung cancer or throat cancer. Okay. And he was telling people about the dangers of smoking and watching it. I was freaked out. You know, the 80s, they just didn't care. Right. Like, they didn't care if you were a kid. Like, there's yeah. some of the stuff that was on TV, right? And I'm watching it. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I, was, I got worried for my mom because my mom smoked. And she's like, that's why you don't smoke. She's like, do you know who that is? And I didn't even recognize him. I said, no. She's like, that's Yul Brenner from Magnificent Seven. And I was like... Holy oh shit! And we'll touch a cigarette. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> we'll touch a cigarette after that. Like this amazing, like man with this presence, like was really down to nothing. Right, right. And he did a commercial about it, you know. And he's smoking in every single movie he's in. For yeah, the most part cigars. But yeah, that's wild. I, I've only seen the Magnificent Seven uh, once, one time. So I got to watch that again. I, I would watch it. It's it's good. Come yeah. on, Charles Bronson, James Coburn. I yeah, mean, right. I mean, Hell of a team. But now that I just told you those things, yeah. you're gonna, you're gonna be, be watching it. and laugh a few times. <laughs> yeah, I definitely fell more into the uh, like the spaghetti western right kind of style. Oh, yeah, like, the oh they, searchers. They got, like, I mean, whole, the searchers is probably yeah. the only John Wayne film that I like. I, yeah. I didn't grow up a John Wayne fan at all. Yeah, no, neither did I. I haven't yeah. seen any. I mean, I saw searchers for the first time maybe a year ago. 
Uh, Secret Movie Club screened it at Million Dollar Theater off what is that? Like right next to the Grand Central oh, I Market. Oh, saw it on the theater. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, so I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to wait, see it here. Beautiful, um, beautiful film. Yeah, no, it was amazing to see that that way for sure. But yeah, it's probably that, one of his better really... performances too. I mean, I don't, yeah. I've watched a lot of John Wayne. I just, I, there was something about him I just never really. Uh, right. There's some put on about him that mm-hmm. I didn't like. And he was just, you know. I just, and then you realize what an a-hole he is later. Yeah, So, so right. my suspicions were correct. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to get into like after knowing all well, that. Well, and they mentioned it a little bit in the movie Trumbo. Did you ever see Trumbo? Oh, no, no. Um, what's his name? Uh, plays Trumbo. Was the, it Brian Black, Cranston. Brian right. Cranston plays him, but there's a scene with John Wayne. Okay. You know, and he's like this gung-ho American mm-hmm. Guy and uh, Trumbo was like, you know, well, where were you during World War II? Because I was in Okin- Okinawa, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> of course, he he didn't serve in the war, yeah. um, and Trumbo did. You know, that's the irony of, of but you know, movies right. and image and all that stuff. Like um, James, like I remember reading uh, James Cagney's biography. He's my favorite actor, mm-hmm. and he was up for the role of Father Flan- Father Flanagan for Boys Town. Mm. I don't know if you ever saw Boys Town, no. but uh, it's based on there's an actual place called Boys Town where all these delinquents they would send, and this priest called Father Flanagan was the one that started it, and they wanted to tell his story, and at the time the nuns ran Boys Town, so James Cagney Warner Brothers wanted James Cagney to do it, and the nuns didn't want him because of his image of playing gangsters all the time, mm-hmm. and James Cagney was like the most straight guy outside of Hollywood, so. Uh, Spencer Tracy got it, who was a raging alcoholic and cheating on his wife with Catherine Hepburn. Mm. That's who the nuns wanted to play Father Flanagan. Damn. <laughs> so there was this disconnect of image versus who someone really is. Right. You know, right. and that's so funny. And know? Spencer Tracy's brilliant in it, but I'm like, Cagney would have killed that role. Yeah. Like, just especially with Mickey Rooney being a little punk that he was at that time. You should watch that film. It was, it's a yeah. Really- I, James Cagney's filmography is one I've got to go down. There's oh, so many man. movies I've, I've got to watch. Like, yeah, it's, it just, it's a massive undertaking. It gets overwhelming <laughs> to stop watching movies altogether. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you ever have that kind of, I just, uh, there's a buddy of mine, a uh, bartender friend of mine. Who lo- he's in the film noir right now. And okay. he's got me, he's like, yeah, man, watch pickpocket and watch uh gun crazy. And I just mm. watched gun crazy on, uh, Tubi, uh, 1954 film, um, and believe the camera work in that will blow you away. Okay, yeah. And um, like you're like you've got to remind yourself this is 1954. Wow. I, yeah. I love seeing older films like that yeah. when you just notice, yeah, like camera movement or just choices that were so beyond the time. Oh, and it's yeah. like, oh, you were like really thinking on a whole other level, whole level for like different everyone level. else at that time. And like, it was, and I think it's again they they those types of directors were. These were nothing films to the studio, right. so they were able to do whatever they wanted, yeah, right. you know. But they weren't; they didn't get the publicity, or they didn't get the. Mm-hmm. But luckily, they're out there because of Criterion. They, you know, they yeah. get out there. But uh, so that's what I've been into now is just watching old films that like nobody knows about, right? You know, and taking stuff from them, helping my writing as well, but mostly for directing and um, and my genre. I just I love the urban genre. Yeah. So. Um, and it goes back. I mean, you, you, it's wild that some of the stuff they did, you know, uh, there's a, was it called Blackboard Concrete Jungle or, oh man. There was I, an Asphalt Jungle? Asphalt Jungle, I, yeah. I, I have that Criterion Blu-ray. I have not watched it oh, yet. Oh yeah. But I yeah, got it. Yeah, man. That's a wild film. Okay, and yeah. you have like uh, Klinger from Mashes in it. Okay. He plays like a hood and you have Sidney Poitier. I think Sidney Poitier is one of his first early films. Okay. Young Sidney Poitier. And uh, yeah, it's a wild film. Like, yeah. You're like, wow, they made that in the early 50s. That's pretty black okay. and white. I'm like, how'd they get away with that? Like. But I think they were so small, nobody cared. And that's somewhat similar today. Like when, when if a filmmaker gets a film and nobody in the studio doesn't care about it, you can make something great. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> like Prey. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you watch contemporary films often? Like, are you going to the theater less pretty less. regularly? Less and less. Yeah. yeah I just, mean, yeah. How do you feel about just like this age we're in now? If, I mean, there was some YouTube video I watched fairly recently where, where they brought up like the full slate of here's all the movies coming in 2024. And I think every single one with the exception of maybe one movie, I don't even know what it was. And obviously there's going to be indie films and all yeah. this other stuff, but as far as big theatrical movies, everything was a sequel or a remake. Yeah. And or IP like, of yeah. Some sort of spinoff. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess that what's your take on all that? My thing is, fine but like 
are you making a movie that's memorable? Mm -hmm. You know, I think back to, again, going back to the 80s and films that were made that you'd want to see over and over and over and over again. Right. Right. I can't think of one Avengers film that I want to see again. Mm. I can't, couldn't tell you lines from it. I couldn't tell you even a scene from it. Right. Transformers, like, I love the first Transformers, but all the movies after that, except with the exception of Bumblebee. Bumblebee was made in that style. I've heard that one was good. Yeah, I've I haven't seen it. it, but I've heard it's actually like a That sleeper. one I'll watch again and again and again. Okay. And again, what is the, what is the, what is the, look, there's a great freaking series on HBO Max called something movies. <laughs> the magic of movies. Okay. UCLA professor for like 50 years mm -hmm. talking about why these movies are memorable. Right. And everything he says to me does not apply to movies today. I think it's, it's two things. One, the studios don't want to make those movies. They're more want, they want the roller coaster rides. Right. Yeah. And that's fine, but it doesn't necessarily mean, look, it, it, that's a big question mm -hmm. because I remember a time when a movie came out in the theater and they used to track how long it was number one for. And I remember the last time I remember that a movie doing that was Titanic because it was like number one for like 30 weeks in a row or something like that. Yeah. They lasted that long because people went back to see it again and again and again. Right. What's the last movie you saw in the theater that you had to see in the theater again and again and again? I did see Radical twice. <laughs> Radical? Okay. <laughs> I did see that twice. Okay. But, but yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. And I'm like... I can't think of one. Yeah. You know, because they don't make them that way. Hollywood's got a look, and that's kind of what's killed the industry a little bit is DVD sales went away, right? So right. these mid tier movies are not getting made. Yeah. Because these mid tier movies could have bombed at the theater but had a DVD sale. Right. Run, right. That's gone. And that problem hasn't been fixed yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, Cord Johnson, the guy who did. Uh, Oh, Cord Jefferson, Jefferson, who did American Fiction. Yes, American yeah. Fiction. He just said it loud at the Academy Awards, which yeah. is so right. I, I, I loved his speech. I mean, yeah. that was perfect. Mm -hmm. But I think for executives, there's no sexiness to to producing a $10 million or $20 yeah. million dollar film. Not going to take a risk yeah. or anything. Yeah. But the interesting thing about the Academy Awards this year was Cord Jefferson winning and what he said, which was brilliant. But mm -hmm. the biggest thing, and Hollywood just didn't pay attention to it, Godzilla Minus One won special effects with a $15 million budget. They were up against a billion dollars in special yeah, effects. right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, and there's why, it wasn't the special effects. They won for special effects because they did it with so little money. But the reason why that movie was so well done was because of the story mm -hmm. and the emotion mm -hmm. that was in it. And the point that that filmmaker was trying to make about Japanese culture after World War II. Yeah. It was so deep. And that, now that you mention it, I did see that three times at the end. Yes. That was, <laughs> I, saw yeah. it, I saw it twice, and then they did the black and white release, and I went again to see it in black and white. Oh, my God. It, it I was didn't a even one, know they did a black yeah, and white it was, release. It was a one week only. I, I forgot. Um, I got to see when, that. Yeah. I, I hope. Did you see... It, uh, um, the chrome version of uh oh mad max yes. hell yeah hell yeah i heard when it when they initially dropped that that it was also going to be like silent to show that it played as silent film they could. it wasn't but they could <laughs> yeah because that's another perfect example of yeah it's all there in the um, visual but yeah even to you know to your point like the fact that yeah like uh, bringing up raiders of the lost ark again it's like yeah there's nothing like like that now, I think I even posed that question to my high school students last year. I don't remember the answers, but I don't remember. I'm pretty sure I did it at least once of like, what are the movies that like, what's like the big movie? Like you'd watch again and that you right. remember really well. That'd be a well. great question and, to high school kids. Yeah. Or middle, you teach middle school or high it, school? It was high school. High school. I, and it was, it was all like say. freshman through senior. And I don't remember what the answers right. were. It probably was Marvel. Like every once in a while, there'd be a couple students in there that were into like Edgar Wright movies or something. Right. And it's like, Oh, okay. Maybe you driver I think is there. I probably seen yeah. that multiple times. That, that one yeah. I only saw once, but it felt to me like he was, I, I'll have to watch it again. But upon my first viewing, it felt like he was maybe trying to channel Tarantino a little bit well, in the oh, writing. Definitely, definitely yeah. Like I just was. remember them at the diner and some of the dialogue. Oh, yeah. I'm like, 
You're trying to do Quentin right now. Just <laughs> last night in Soho, I think is his masterpiece. So that one's great. That was that, a great that movie. movie. That was, yeah, really, was good. really good as well. Yeah, yeah I think. Um, yeah, so I just think that the I don't think that the will of the studios is there, and plus, mm-hmm. so you having filmmakers coming up and look. I mean, if 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 you've done some art house films and Marvel comes calling to hire you to do a, to do one of their films, I think that's a hard thing to say no to. Yeah. But I really have uh, a lot of admiration for the people that can make it work. Like, you know, um, uh, I think the Black Panther film was really interesting because Ava DuVernay was offered that and she turned it down. She just oh, didn't I see didn't her. know that. Yeah, okay. she did not see herself working in that system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so first of all, I thought that took guts. Yeah. And she still has a career, mm-hmm. you know, uh, over it. She's doing much different things. And for, oh God, what's the director's Ryan name? Ryan Coogler. Ryan Coogler, to get that opportunity and make a personal story yeah. from that huge of a property, mm-hmm. that's a talent, yeah. you know? And that's a film I remember and I love. And, and I even like the, the, the second Black Panther I love because of the Namor character. Yeah. The problem with that was a lot of legal issues with the Namor character. You know, that was a character striving to be the lead. And they had to keep him where he was. Right. Because Universal owns the Namor character. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah. But yeah, now that you mention that, that's an interesting way to put it. Like yeah. that kind of makes And sense. I was like, there is a re- he could only be a supporting character because that is Universal giving them permission to do that and keep him there. You know, they do not own, Marvel does not own the Nam- Namor character. Wow. So crazy. there's an interesting, di- like, and him for him to get his own movie, it's it's got to be a Universal and the thing is, like all these studios, to me, it's like rap battles. Like it's so <laughs> stupid. Like nobody, nobody picks a side. Right. Like people listen to this rapper and that rapper. People go to th- these movies. It's no, there's no DC versus Marvel. People right. go to all of them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so I always find like it interesting when they don't want to work together to make something cool. You know, um, because they're in competition with each other, yeah. but they're really not. Like that's kind of like with the Sony and the Spider Man. Yeah, stuff. at least they made that. Yeah. You know, they did that. But even like Godzilla, like I love the fact that like the company that owns Godzilla told you know American companies, yeah, go ahead and make your Godzilla movies. We're gonna make our own yeah. movie. Yeah, you guys do your thing. We're gonna make our own movie, and they've made an incredible it, movie. It, <laughs> man, it was kind of crazy. So a couple of weeks ago, I finally watched uh, Godzilla and Kong. I don't know if you saw that. Yes, because I, I, I did. Like, I like them, and they're I like fun. That and one. It's I like, like the, the one, the '60s one. I like that one a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. it was at Kong School yes, Island. Yeah, I love that one. And it's like you know what you're you're getting in in for. It's right. like here we we want to see the monsters fight. That's yeah. it. We want to see King Ghidorah and all that. Yeah. You know? And but man. <laughs> Seeing it after watching Minus One, it's like, oh, good no, lord, guys. No, yeah, I didn't even see the, the next, <laughs> yeah. after Minus One, I didn't even go see the next, because my son loves those f- films, yeah. so we would always go see those. But they were actually, I liked them, yeah. and, especially and, with Ghidorah. Like, I yeah. mean, she's huge. Yeah. I, mean, I say she, I don't know if she's a she or not, but um, she's just, mo- and, and and there was something beautiful about it, and Mothra, and, and like, yeah. the, I love the way well, that I filmmaker think. told that story. Mm-hmm. And, um, but you can only see things get crushed so many times and destroyed. But after I saw Minus One, I had no desire to see the latest Kong film. Right, right. I don't even know. Kong had a metal arm. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's what I saw a couple weeks ago. I was like, (laughs) oh, yeah. It's fun. I mean, they're fighting. They're duking it out. But, man. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's funny. You know, Martin Scorsese made that comment about, like, Marvel not being cinema and it's just a ride. And the, the cinema aspect of it, Whatever I don't know. Movies are movies. I, yeah. I I enjoy junk food, and sometimes I want prestige. Kale, you know yeah, what I mean? Like, absolutely. You know, it's like there's the junk food movies and there's the vegetable movies, right. whatever. But I am. I mean, he's not wrong. And like you know, minus one cinema, and then Godzilla X Kong. Like, yeah, it's a roller coaster. It's fun. It's a ride. Right. I went on. I went up. You went up and down and around, and I had a good time. And the thrills gone. But the one I'm thinking about. Is still minus is one. minus one Absolutely. like that made the impact and I, I think it's a bummer that it didn't get nominated for best international or even best picture, picture. It, I sh- mean, it should have been up there <laughs> absolutely yeah. i mean i'm glad they won vfx s- v- video yeah. effects yeah. that that to me should have sent a, a huge message to hollywood mm-hmm. i don't think it did yeah but again it comes down to look if it's if like this producer i'm, I'm working with right now on this project like she she's like She's been through it and she's worked on Oppenheimer. She worked on Winning Time. Oh, yeah. She's got a movie coming out called Nuremberg with um, Russell Crowe. 
um, you know, she, and she's a woman producer, but yeah. she's like, she's like, and she's like, gets so frustrated. I get the insight from her. She's like, well, we're having these meetings with all these producers and we're not even talking about the making of the movie. Mm. She's like, are we making movies guys? What, is, what is it that we're talking about here? Right. You know, cause what they're talking about has to do with ego or what hotel they're going to stay at, or, you know, who's going to get money or credit for this or that. She's like, we're not even talking story. Yeah. You know? And so I think that's where Hollywood is right now, yeah. where, I mean, if it's gotten to the point where you have a movie like Batgirl get completely $90 million and they make more, better, it's a more of a financial, uh, it's a better financial move for them to just kill that film than put it out. Right. Something's broken with your system. Yeah. Especially when there's a demand for the movie. Mm -hmm. You have an Academy Award winning actor playing the villain in it. Right. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And But the other thing that upsets me about that is why am I more upset about it than the two filmmakers that made that movie? I get it. I get it. You don't want to bite a hand that may feed you. Yeah. But they already told you how they feel about you. Like they should. I would have just been. Yeah. I would have been real. everywhere talking smack would about Zazzle. Very, very vocal. <laughs> vocal yes. About and it, take like, it somewhere else. Yeah. Take it somewhere else. I mean, we're in that kind of environment now where one show gets canceled somewhere and it goes somewhere else yeah. or one studio says, you know what, this isn't for us. And then it goes to another studio. Like, I, I, I mean, I question some of these executives. Do you guys even like making movies? I mean, that, yeah, it, it very much seems that way, right? Like it's people that aren't even into films at all it's, that are here, like being the shot callers, you know? No, they, they want the... Look, it's a very ego-driven business, yeah. you know, and the artists, as artists, we're the ones that get taken advantage of or stepped on or whatever. And it's very difficult to navigate, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's part of it. It's not just a talent. It's not just your passion. You have to be able to navigate this business. Yeah. And that's a tough thing to do. Right. You know, but I think if you, for me, it's always looking outside. Okay. There are people making movies outside of the Hollywood system. And that's why a lot of these Latino organizations, I feel like you're trying to just mimic Hollywood, a system you hate, mm. but make it a Latino version of that same system. You're not trying to do anything different. Right. Right. I go, so that's a problem. That's why I don't involve myself with a lot of these things, mm. you know, and a lot of the people that they attract and spend money on the time at the conferences and workshops and things I do are people who are naive and they're just coming up. That's how they, that's how they're able to survive. Right. Anyone with any experience that I know doesn't go to these things because they know that's not how it's done, you know? So, but if you're just starting out and you're like, Oh, here's this organization and they, they do this and they do that. Okay. Let me go and waste five years of my life hmm. being a part of whatever it is they're trying to do. When I always say, just invest in yourself, make your own short film. Yeah. You know, you don't need to be in their showcase that nobody is coming to them that is can get you to that next spot. So I don't know. I mean, I hope some of the, what I've said inspires, you know, I think, you know, again, I don't I sometimes feel like some things I say are discouraging. But I always say no one if you're learn as much as you possibly can mm -hmm. is what I is with the thing. And some of the things you're going to learn are, are discouraging, but you shouldn't be discouraged. Right. No, yeah, I mean, I think everything. um it's good to hear the truth and from someone who's been through it, you know, and who's really doing like actively is in it, you know? And, you know, I, I gotta say like, if, I think I actually through Instagram, we were chatting a little bit at some point, maybe a couple months ago. And I mentioned that I saw, I came across your stuff on like film courage on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. And I remember I was just like, Oh, that's the guy that's the Instagram guy. You know? Cause I, I know there was like comments here and there. Oh on, like, yeah. Absolutely. Posts between us, but I was like, oh shit, all right. And then I, you know, went and watched Matador and all that. And like watching the stuff you were um, talking about, as truthful as it is, and like you bring up the hardships and the reality of it, it was so inspiring to me. Like, I, I, I'm going to oh, say good. it out here. Like, when I talked about doing these short films recently with my friend and trying, like, trying to get that spirit back of um, just going out and doing it, like, in all honesty, like, I think I owe a lot of that to like seeing those interviews with oh, you wow, and like man. listening to you speak. I appreciate that. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad to yeah. hear that. Yeah, man. Like straight up and then hearing it all now, it just gets me kind of juiced up to, to, to get, to get going. And yeah, man, I mean, it's been a blast chatting with you. Like all the stories, everything you've shared is amazing. Like, um, 
you know, I yeah, that that that's it. Everyone will hear it for themselves when they when they watch no, it. I mean, they listen. You have a lot to edit there. here. Uh, yeah. yeah. So um, <laughs> I just had one question for you, and you can include this one because yeah. I remember from earlier. Because when you had said that you showed that you were going to watch Counterpunch, you had pulled my poster. Yeah. Um, and so that wasn't the poster Lionsgate used. Okay. So w- one thing that I always tried to do was because again I grew up in the eighties and movie posters were an art. Yeah. Back yeah. then. And when you start, when I started making my movies, I was like, that was important to me. I wanted my poster. I wanted my DVD cover to be yeah. badass. Yeah. I wanted to be something you would hang on your wall. Mm-hmm. And so my first movie nailed that. My second movie, not so much. And this is something a distributor told me. So the second movie, because I told him, I said, all of them need to be sequ- like the, the posters for the drive-by Chronicles all need to kind of, kind of mirror each other. Okay. Just different colors with different actors, obviously, because they had different stories. They didn't take that advice. And I remember the, the, my most personal film, the poster they came up with, I just hated. Mm. And he told me, look, Ken, your job is to make the movie. My job is to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You focus on doing, don't tell us how to distribute the film or market the film. We won't tell you how to make your film. All right. I said, fair enough, but <laughs> I would always hire an artist to create a poster and then I would just submit it to my distributor or my producer mm-hmm. and then they could do my, it was my way of trying to influence them. Right. Okay. So for Counterpunch, I hired this guy to, to do this and I told him exactly what I wanted and he came up with this beautiful and I love the poster that he came So Alvaro loved the poster. So he's meeting with Lionsgate. The first thing they want to get rid of is the poster. Damn, bro. (laughs) Their poster, they have Danny Trejo on and Alvaro. They took a picture of Alvaro from some other movie where he's wearing a hoodie. Danny Trejo, we had a Hungarian actress. That's another story. But we had a Hungarian actress that had a scene with him. Mm -hmm. And our investor was hung. Anyway, so... The Access Hollywood version of Hungary came to Long Beach to interview her for her one scene with Danny Trejo. So he interviewed with them and he got all gussied up and they took these uh, PR photos of him. Lionsgate used one of those PR photos. (laughs) So I got Danny from the PR photo from this Access Hollywood from Hungary. Yeah. A picture of Alvaro from another film that went nowhere where he's got a hoodie on. Yeah. Yeah. Those two pictures, and in the middle is a boxer going like this, who's not even in our movie. And <laughs> is, this is Lionsgate. Is that is that not the poster that I that I no. did? Let me see, because I remember I just I, sorry I'm looking it up now. Yeah. now I just got to know because I remember like I definitely just pulled it from Google. I don't think I went to your Instagram and found it. Well, I love that you Googled it and my poster came up. Yeah. Oh man, where maybe did I get off IMDb? Because now this is all I'm getting is that one you're talking about. There you about. go. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me see. Maybe none of those movie. pictures are from the movie. Yeah, dang. Or I maybe remember. you got it from my website because I used my poster for the website. Did this you, one right here? That's the one. That's yours. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Alvaro was trying to tell Lionsgate, can you please just use this poster? And yeah. they were like, you want us to put a poster of you where we don't even see you as good as we see you in our poster. And he's like, yes, because that poster is more beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, man. It was heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. The- and then Guapa, wow. same thing. I, I hired this artist. He created this dope ass poster mm-hmm. and like they created posters that I, I put in my living room. I, right. You know, I lied. I don't have an office anymore, but when I get my office, I'm going to put all my movie posters up because I'm proud of them all. Mm -hmm. And um, I gave that to the distributor for that film and they took aspects of it Mm -hmm. and they just made it cheaper. And when I say cheaper, I don't mean money wise. I mean, there's no subtlety to it. There's no artistry to it. It's like, okay, she's an assassin. So they added a hand. You know, I have this woman who's in like half day of the dead and it's a profile shot and it's like all this marble and, it's it's it's, it's uh, the quote from the movie was it's not a small world it's just a small neighborhood and they got rid of all that put a cityscape behind her and someone's hand with a gun and a silencer which she doesn't right. even have a silencer <laughs> in the film the quote's gone i mean and they would sometimes they would do things that were cool and i mean the guy that guy created a whole dvd for me mm-hmm. And it's just disappointing when I see what it, it's sad. And, and it makes sense now, like hearing this, like why so many movie posters and just yeah. all look the same. It's like here's all who's from like three different templates that everyone yeah. just kind of uses over and over again. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it's not there's nothing really 
to them. Like it's just. Yeah. Oh, and it sucks too because yeah. even that you went the distance of like you hired someone, they did it, you gave it to them. That they wouldn't just be like, "All right, cool, yeah, well, I guess the work's done. Here that, we go." That was my thinking. <laughs> you know, like they're yeah. so cheap that they're right. gonna be like, "Oh yeah, let's just take." Uh, yeah, Ken already did the work for us. He already paid for it. Yeah. Let's do it. That was my thinking, right? <laughs> right. But sometimes it's control, bro. Yeah. Sometimes it's control, and they want to be the masters of whatever they're trying to do, sell the film, you know, mm -hmm. and. I get that, but as an artist, I can't help but have an opinion. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, yeah. Well, when it's your your baby, yeah, you know? absolutely. But. So, but yeah, it was great talking to you, man. And yeah, um, yeah really, uh, I just shared your, I don't know if you're on Facebook, but I shared your, uh, or if you're on threads, I'm going to share your doc on threads because uh, oh, it's really beautiful. It's really, it's really charming. It's a charming uh, doc and the way, not just on your subject, but you, you did a great job cutting it and... Um, telling the story, you know, and, and showing LA and showing East LA and not showing East LA in the way that it gets shown. Yeah. Just, this yeah. is really, a, I, I really if appreciate you drive that. By, like yeah. he said on Cesar Chavez Boulevard, when you drive by it, like you miss a lot. Yeah. If you don't know someone from the neighborhood who, you know, Danny's like, right. Oh yeah, that's place, this place, you mm -hmm. miss them driving. Yeah. You know, and like my wife's doing a show, uh, a play in East LA right now. And when I take the train there or if I take a car there, if I walk there, like it, 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 there's so much, it's so rich, mm -hmm. you know? And the great thing about this other film about the Chicano band, yeah. the great thing about it is it all takes place in East LA and Boyle Heights and all the places that they're still there from the sixties. Right. And I love that. Like Echo Park, there's a great book called the Madonnas of Echo Park. Yeah. And I know they were, HBO had the property, I don't know how they got it. Anyway, they had it and they were going to, there's no way you could shoot it in Echo Park because that Echo mm. Park does not exist anymore. Right, right. Because um, this is Echo Park from the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, but my story, I mean, where Cannibal grew up, the all that's still there. So I'm excited that if we do get the chance, we're going to shoot it, you know, in East LA. So I get to wake up in the morning and just, I could probably ride my bike to work yeah. if I wanted to. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's super cool. It's like all those, cause man, all the older buildings and places seem to be disappearing pretty fast yeah. now. So anything period that can be done to like be in the actual yeah. space. Is East like, LA Boyle Heights yeah. has managed to hang on as much yeah. as they talk about. And I love Danny says it in gentrification. Yeah, right. <laughs> he's like gentrification. Yeah. Like, it's all he's all the, like, the same, same places yeah. from 45 <laughs> 40, 50 years ago yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. loved when he said that yeah. I'm like but Echo Park is a good example oh man. yeah yeah that's a good example yeah I mean you want to talk justification there yeah. yeah but Boyle Heights and East LA parts of the San Fernando Valley you mm. know where my parents grew up you know a lot of these places um still for better or for worse I mean where I grew up in Wilmington you know I was praying for gentrification over there <laughs> like, that's just like change something here right. please you know and I remember a tea shop uh coffee shop opened up and I went, oh, wow. I mean, the liquor store I went to as a kid is still there. Mm. You know, the barber shop I went to as a kid is still there. Yeah. You know, the, the arcade and bowling alley across the street from that is gone. You know, now it's a Tres Hermanos, you know, market or, or a clothing store. But yeah, Wilmington does not change. Just doesn't change. All that money from the port and it just stays the same. Yeah. It's just, but it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, man. Well, anything you want to plug real quickly before we um, leave? Yeah, we just uh, Marigold, the Matador, Ma Marigold the Matador, my seventh, and Counterpunch, my fifth. They're both mm -hmm. on uh, Amazon Prime and Tubi. They're both very different films if you check them out. Um, yeah, and you can check me out at KennethCastillofilm.com. I'm going to be teaching a class if you're for all you directors out there that want to learn how to communicate better with your actors. I'm teaching a class on that uh, in the fall, possibly the summer if uh, – mm -hmm this next week things come together this next week I might bump it up to the summer but um, definitely by the fall I'll be teaching so I'm excited about that and you know the next time we talk hopefully uh, one of these two projects that are on the cusp gets funded um, and I'll be on set hopefully by the fall we'll see yeah well thanks a lot man it's been great having you here yeah appreciate you man yeah. thank you cheers Thank you for listening to the Drinks in a Movie podcast. You can now find us on Instagram at Drinks in a Movie Pod, where we'll be posting photos from all the various films that we discuss. You can also email us at Drinks in a Movie Pod at gmail.com. Please rate, review, and subscribe. And thank you for listening.